You are listening to episode 65 of In Film We Trust. I'm Liam. I'm Wayne. A weekly podcast where we discuss, dissect, and deep dive all things film, from the obscure to the mainstream. And now, on with the show. If you listened to last week's episode delved into Black Christmas with Phil from Flixology 101, then you would have heard of us teasing an upcoming episode that differs from all our previous ones, an episode that isn't taking a deep dive into a specific film. Well, here it is, because for this episode we are joined by our fellow countryman, Scottish indie filmmaker David Wilde. With films such as his debut Pasty Faces under his belt, Wilde may not be immediately recognisable to many of you, but as a filmmaker who has been in the industry for over two decades, Wilde has certainly collected a treasure trove of stories and experiences, and luckily for us at In Film We Trust, he is here to dispense what he has learnt throughout his career, his experiences at the Cannes Film Festival, and his successful Kickstarter campaign for his latest horror film, Psycho Sex Dolls, that is soon to start production. So. For all you button filmmakers and movie fans alike, take a seat as we take you on a tour of what life is like on the independent film circuit. So if you've been listening to the last couple of episodes of In Film We Trust, you know that we've had a guest on for each of the last few episodes. It's been a lot of fun. We've had a great time discussing some films. We're moving into spooky season now. Last week we covered Black Christmas with Phil DeGlass of the excellent Flixology 101. That was a lot of fun. This week we have another guest, but this one is quite different because we're going to talk about a film today that doesn't actually exist, and we are talking to an actual filmmaker. <laughs> Let us introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Wilde. David, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing, David? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks, guys, for inviting me on. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, you know. Funnily enough, this is the first time we've had a, a fellow Scotsman, Dave. Great. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Great. So, you're the first of our own nationality, and you're the first one who's brought us a film that doesn't yet exist. How does that feel? <laughs> um, that's quite odd. It doesn't yet exist. I can't remember how <laughs> <laughs> just reminded me it doesn't exist yet <laughs> um, is that sour grapes was that sour grapes Dave? yeah no 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 <laughs> that, hey, that's that's the movie business a movie doesn't exist when yeah. it's on a screenplay until it's actually funded and then shot and then posted so absolutely absolutely you know so i'm assuming that a lot of our audience probably at this point because most of our audience over i think 70 percent are international whether that's united states brazil canada they may not have came across you before, so do you want to ingratiate yourself, David, with our audience? Yeah, most of the planet won't know who the hell I am, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I'm, I started off as an actor for years, um, many years ago, and then I got into filmmaking because I was I was a bit like Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie. It was about a problem on the set. I always used to question things, a pain in the right. ass, and then directors used to say, why don't you make your own movies? So they were kind of right. I was kind of a frustrated filmmaker. So cut long story short, I started to... Uh, get into filmmaking um, and unlike m uh, many filmmakers that start off with no money I kind of I got a deal to get a budget movie which was my first film which was a, a kind of in a way a bit of a curse it's not the way you start films right. so yep. I kind of went from there and it wasn't a great experience it actually because it's an industry movie which I can talk about but um, it actually put me off so much that I never made another film for about eight years I kind of disappeared there wasn't any filmmaking um, it, but if something's in your DNA you've got to do right. it so when the new, new technology came in I started to get back into it and I could control what I was doing so that is the sort of kind of path I mean there's a lot more to it than that but uh, that's, just, that's the sort of way I started acting then any filmmaking any writing and directing really so you're discussing your debut feature there, which I'm assuming is Pasty Faces. Oh, the, the, the bloody title was terrible. <laughs> it's very <laughs> Scottish, I may it say. Very like Scottish. A, it sounds like a children's foundation film, you know. It sounds like some... <laughs> um, and I, I can't remember how that happened. I think I was drunk one night when the producer says, throw us a few titles, and I gave them 20 titles, and I says, don't pick that one. And they all wanted and that they picked one. It. <laughs> but can and, I ask you, your debut feature, it took you from the UK, it took you to Las Vegas and LA. How did that come about? Because that's quite an unusual trajectory for a debut feature. So, because I know throughout your career, you've self-funded film, for example. How did you get that chance on your debut? Well, it was back in, uh, I mean, this was, you're talking to me back in 2000, the late 90s, um, 
when I, there was there wasn't any films made in the UK really. Right. People weren't making right. films in digitals. There was no DSLRs. There was no phones. So it was re- so in Scotland there was only a handful of films made, like you know, Peter Mullen films, and you know, and it was the time of Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels when they were kind of looking for comedy movies and stuff. Cut a long story short, I'd done a play version, and the play kind of worked well. Um, I, I was in London for years. I came back to Scotland. I thought kind of I went to London to try and do some acting. I came back to Scotland, done a play. And then I get this crazy idea to just try and get a business plan and try and make a movie. And I knew London, so I went back to Soho, knocked on other doors, right. um, went to the Cannes Film Festival, went to Los Angeles, and uh, we had a script. And I think people like my passion and my kind of energy for it. And I bumped into Guy Ritchie's kind of uh, Matthew Vaughn at the time, he was a producer. I spoke to him, trying to get money out of him. And he says, Oh, we just made tons of money because of lock stock. And I was like, All right, all right, don't need brag about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me some money then. So but, Matthew Vaughn directed Kickass, did he not? He, yeah, yeah, he so. became a director. Yeah. You know, yeah. and one of those uh, Avenger, the what was the one was big superhero movies. But back then he was Guy Ritchie's producer. But he never entertained me. But one of his, his financers, he put me forward to one of his financers in Metrodome Distribution um, Company, and it kind of went from there. I ended up, you know, back in Soho, and I kind of got the film funded through their kind of financers, the, the conventional way that you make films, sales agents, private investors and distribution companies, we can and all that. Um, and it kind of came together then. Um, but I didn't even know how to make a film. I, I hustled the whole thing, you know. But you say it was a terrible experience. What was it about that particular film that, you know, it kind of set you onto this path of self-funded filmmaking? What was so terrible about it? Well, no, I mean, I was green a lot of the, the way. Uh, um, and at the same time, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I realised over the years. When I went, when I first made that movie, I was at the Cannes Film Festival. I always remember when I was trying to get a movie made, nobody in Britain was entertaining you to make movies. They weren't interested. Scottish right. screen, you know, they, they weren't interested. Um but I remember uh, uh, I managed to get a digital version of the movie shot when digital first came in. Nobody was really shooting anything in digital. And uh, there was a company called Next Waves Films with Peter Broderick in America. And he was basically a filmmaker that shot something in this new digital. Then they would get him post-production money. So I went to see him in Cannes and he'd actually gave money to Christopher Nolan. And I remember being in, I remember being in Cannes and seeing this. And I've, I'm saying, I'm saying, I was there with my sister. I've got this colourful caper movie that's set in Hollywood, <laughs> right? And I remember seeing P- uh, Peter Broderick, who was the company guy, and I'd seen this poster beside him that looked kind of black and white and gritty, and I went, right. look at that poster, it looks pretty shitty, you know? And uh, it ended up being Christopher Nolan's following. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Still not as good as Memento. But he got he got <laughs> money for this guy to finish his film because nobody in, in, in the UK was entertaining him, you know, because that's what they like. So I was kind of in that circuit at that time. Cut a long story short, I ended up... The reason, back to your question, I realised that after I made the movie, you know, I wasn't one of those people that read Robert Rodriguez's uh, Robert Rodriguez's book about making a film without a crew. I never read that book before I made a film. But what I realised was, and I realised that all these filmmakers like Kevin Smith and Christopher Nolan and, and, and Robert Rodriguez and many other directors, they made their first movies themselves to control a vision. So they get no interference. So they made it for 10 grand, 7 grand. They get no interference at all. And then they start to get control as they go on. When you make a movie and you've got no experience, really, and you're taking 350,000, then everybody is coming in there, every producer with their suggestions. But and you're not, and you go, well, you've not really tried and tested yet. You've not really shown us nothing. So, but which is a, a strange thing because you greenlight a movie, then you should trust the filmmaker to finish it to the end. But mm-hmm. they don't. So I had nothing to show. I had no, so what I realised after that was, you should start making films with no money to show that you've got some sort of vision and so you should start producing them. You should start learning lighting cameras everything where I, I turned up on the set I didn't even the first day of the shoot I was shooting in Glasgow I says to the cameraman where's the camera go he goes I don't fucking know you're director <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I swear it's okay to swear and I said, I was, no I it's talking. okay to swear um, and, yeah. I, and, and, and I basically so I had to hustle it and I says right well, stick a camera over his shoulder and a camera over his shoulder and after a few days I get that I mean I wrote the script so I knew what I wanted but I still was hustling it do you know what I mean whereas today you can get and shoot a phone and you can shoot multiple movies before you get to that level that somebody gives you some money, you know. Um, so you can you can learn and make mistakes. I had to, and I actually had the pressure of lock stock 
well, this could be the next lock stock. I had that pressure on me. And you don't need that pressure because actually lock stock and two small smoking barrels was going to be, was actually going to bomb. Um, the guy that funded that I knew, he more or less says nobody wanted it. It was only because of the soundtrack. They managed to sell the soundtrack and Vinnie Jones got in the 10 o'clock news or something. So, Does that so? I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. Nobody had wanted it at the start. So I had all that pressure on me and I had never made a film before. So even though it looked, you saw your little the little clip I put on Instagram, um, yeah, it, it was. It, I could. Everybody had a great time and fun, but I was kind of dying inside because I knew I wasn't getting the film that I wanted to get. You know. Well, I know. I, I know films like you know, Lock, Stock, and then Snatch. After that, you're saying that they were like somewhat of an oddity in America because when you have films like that, I know a lot of British films because they use a lot of slang, so a lot of them don't translate that well over to the Atlantic. And you're saying something like a comedy, <laughs> a comedy kind of word because I know with like I watched the Pasty Cakes trailer. Uh, pasty faces trail. I have to say, it feels like it should be. It should have the adventures of beforehand. Yeah, like the adventures of well, pasty faces. Yeah. Well, the, uh, yeah. Were you worried? Were you worried about the comedy in that film and its sensibilities translating over there? I can't really worry about that. And um, that was up to producers whether they thought that. What I did was I put a play on, right? And when you put a play on in a situation comedy, you don't have to go across the world. You just have to be in a situation comedy. And if the dialogue's good between the characters, that's what works, right? In a situation comedy, right? But the minute you take a film across the world and you've got 100 locations um, that's why most f- films first films are set in one location you know when you take it all over the mm-hmm. world you start to lose the script oh we can't do yeah. that scene we can't do that scene and before you know it all you've got is a 90 minute trailer you don't have the script <laughs> you don't have with Neil and I you don't have characters <laughs> great in the film room. Do you know I mean? brilliant film so you don't have you, you don't yeah. have swingers with John Favreau you oh know, I love because, that film we've done I that, love that film, film. Well. Yeah, exactly so my point the, the script that I had exactly was more like that. It was more because when I done the play, it was just characters bantering with each other, and the actual dialogue worked. Yeah. But when I made the movie, the producer was like, "We need to lose that scene. We need to lose that scene." And, we, and before you know it, there is no spirit left in the film. There is no because it was meant to be about characters at the territory, like you know the Eddie Murphy going to America. It's meant to be these two guys that go to LA after Braveheart and they're trying to get. A, so it was there was a more. It just turned into a, a stupid caper. Um. So I actually get. <laughs> But the producers should have known that when you take a film all over the world, you're taking away the quality because you're taking away, all you're doing is making a big trailer then. Um, he had the experience of that because he made Hellraiser. He made um, he made a few movies before that. He wasn't, you know, but he wanted to go to Las Vegas and, yep. and, and party. Producers have got their, they've got their other uh, agendas when they make movies. You know, They just want money. That, it's they just money, want money. It? And they just They're want, the money man. Yeah, so they don't have this, the creative reason that I wanted to do it. I, I was miserable in Vegas, you know, because I wasn't getting the movie I wanted, yeah. you know, so. Now, can I ask you that? That's, mm. a, that's an interesting point to discuss. You're saying the producer now. Many people think, you know, what exactly does a, the production side entail? What does the producer do? <laughs> What are they navigating behind the scenes with the director, with the creator, as in your case, yourself? What are they navigating? What are they changing? What are they trying to do? Are they trying to push it into a more a palatable agenda f- to sell the most? What are they doing? Well, that should be done beforehand in the script, and that should right. be, say, this is a movie that we make, and this is the movie that we all agree to make. But that doesn't happen that way. They change it. Right. It's almost like when you put your money on a horse... The horse runs in the race to the end, and you either win or lose. On filmmaking, they're constantly taking it off, they're changing it, they're doing that. And, you know, so a producer basically, there's different producers. There's producers that pull the finance together, they've got the finance together, line producers, and then there's producers that are there with a the creative filmmaker to try and protect the creator, the, the, the director's vision, so that they get the vision. Um, yep. But then they, they say, look, hey, if the schedule goes wrong, then the producer's got to pull up the schedule and say, we can't do that scene, we can't do this, whatever. Um, the producer also is on a phone call with the financers and says stuff like, in my film, David, we need those, ch- they had, you know, you had to have a, a meeting on a, a, you know, almost like a city council meeting about whether you can say that line or this line that you've changed. And that's not the way you make movies. Because in the moment, you get the spur in the moment, things that are, don't sound natural in the script and the actor says something, go, that works, let's say that. But, but then, they're what they're very committee-based. Yeah, then you've got to go right. be committee and say, we've changed that line. Before you know it, it's taking the spirit and everything away. Now, this is okay if you're making a 100 million, 200 million yep. movie. 
But when you're making it, still, which was classed back then, three hundred thousand is still a no budget movie back then. Right. Today, that's a good budget, but back then it was nothing, you know. So, how, um, so how does that work? When you finished a film, for example, like Pasty Faces, and you've had this interference from producers, does it still feel like your film? No, was it what no. you set out to make? No, it feels nothing like the film. Hey, look, right. I made many mistakes because I'm an experienced, but at the same time, the producer producers should have known we can't right. shoot all this film across the world but I still want to go you know so I take responsibility and know my um, where I was green but at the same time it's not the movie that you want to shoot it's not the script that you shot put it this way if you've got a decent script which is a script it wasn't a great script it wasn't a masterpiece um, but it was, yeah. it was a good <laughs> little keeper movie but if you've got a good script it's very hard to mess it up if you just shoot that script because everything is in the script it's all dictated by the script. Yep. But if you mess up that script, you can mess up a decent film because you say, we'll cut that, we'll cut this, we'll cut this, you know. So so mm. are you trying to say that one of the reasons that people like independent films so much, because I know there's not as much, as much money, there's not as much prestige, but you would say as an independent filmmaker, you feel a lot more liberated because the two words nowadays that are almost the death knell of big movies are studio interference. Because like you say, they come in, they recut the movie, they decide how this has to be removed films end up this kind of hasty patchwork but for you being able to self-fund do things yourself means you can create the kind of movie you want to create and that's that's where you thrive you would say well, there's, two, there's, there's, there's still many sides to that coin because a lot of filmmakers say if i can, can just control my movie but when you're working with no budget there's always compromises when you're working with no budget there's compromises but even when you're working with budgets, there's compromises because the compromises are, if you take a lot of money for say, a studio or a big production company, there's compromises there because you've got to say these certain things and do these certain things, which I'm totally fine with. If somebody gave me 100 million, a 30, I'm trying a 30 million action movie. If you made a 30 million action mm -hmm. movie and they go, you need to hit this box, you need to take that box, you need to do this, you need to, well, that's fine. Let's agree beforehand the movie we're making for market and the lunch boxes and everything else. And we know we have to appeal to everybody. That's fine. But when you're making a movie, it's much smaller and more kind of small right. and intimate. You don't want to be appealing to all that stuff. You you want the freedom. So you're better off going back to making the movies yourself. Um, we we no money and you control it. Unless you're going to make a big studio film, that's different. It's a different animal, you know. So what age did you realize you had this tenacity? Because you clearly have a, a quite voracious tenacity for filmmaking throughout your bad experience, throughout self-funding. So what age did you realize, look, filmmaking is for me. Filmmaking is what I want to do. Was there any specific films in your youth that kind of guided you? Because you have a very punk rock attitude, I may say, a very do DIY <laughs> attitude. Well, I think it's because it's a necessity. It's not so much, right, uh, you right. know, today everybody's doing kind of DIY. Um, no, when I started, I had no desire to be an actor or be a filmmaker. My dad took me to the cinema lot in the 70s in Glasgow, took me to the Odeon. And every movie that was playing there in the 70s, I was a teenager, I'm 57. So it was usually disaster movies. I thought the world was coming <laughs> yeah. to fucking end. It was always <laughs> the Tower Inferno, Airport in 1975, okay, you know, Earthquake. Every movie I've seen, people were dying and, you know, the land <laughs> Bizarrely, we grew up in the nineties with the same disaster films. Yeah, it's like it's it's, in, it's just interesting those genres that kind of go in and out of vogue because people talk about how you know now superhero movies are big and then yeah. they go out, and then yet sci-fi movies are big and then they go yeah. out. So it's like disaster movies have these weird kind of peaks and troughs throughout. The yeah, generations. well, they, they, and and but the, the Superman movie first came in this when I seen that as a kid, and, and then the quality disaster, the, the quality B movie started to come in, which was basically Jaws and Close Encounters and Star Wars, yep. which I've seen in the cinema. So that rubbed off. But at the same time, when you're in Glasgow seeing movies like that, you don't even think about the entertainment business. It's so far from you because you're going to the factory when you come out of school, you know. So it's not even in yeah. your vogue. It's just that that's that's in, that's fantasy land. That's not even you know. So I, that never came into my head about getting into filmmaking. When I was in my twenties, I never even thought about that. It wasn't until my late twenties I thought about. It. I went to London, but I mainly partied in London, and I, I tried I, again. <laughs> As you, you know, as a hey, young you're man, a young guy, you're a young guy, of course. But yeah, but at the same time, I try to find something. I didn't want to just go to working bars where I was working or cleaning pots and kitchens and stuff. Um, so I started to do some acting classes and I started to kind of get noticed by casting directors. I even got a call for Gary Oldman one day. Oh really? Um, yeah, he was doing a film. His first people think his first film was called it was Nil by Mouth. Nil by Mouth. Yeah. Actually, his first film was going to be a film called Lords of the Urban Jungle. Oh. Um, it was a gangster okay. film set in London. <laughs> and I, didn't, I was just right to write I was just to write to stars. I was twenties and I was a wannabe. I used to go up to Pinewood Studio and see if there was any jobs at Pinewood. And 
<laughs> but yeah. whether we're making the next Bond, Bond aye, film you get any, or something. Yeah, like parts that. there, <laughs> you know. Like, <laughs> but you've got to be naive when you're young. But I used to write to Anthony Hopkins. I wrote to Gary Oldman through his wife, and I got a call one day for him, which I was, and I put I put oh. the phone down, and I said, "Fuck off!" I thought it was a mate, and I went like that. <laughs> I don't have any mates because <laughs> I just moved to London. <laughs> and, he, and he called back laughing, and he's and then he realised it's for Glasgow, so he tried to make me feel at ease because I was shitting myself. And he says he was in the Glasgow Citizens Theatre; that's where he started, you know. Um, and he was going to give my—I I wrote my very impassioned letter. Like the letter was on fire, and I think he liked that fire; it was burning, you yeah, know. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm. But anyway, the movie never became anything, and he went it ain't no by mouth, you know. Yeah, so those movies in the theatre, theatrical, was those movies. And then when the VHS market came in, like 1981 or something, my father got a VHS video recorder. He had nothing else. We lived in a tenement block. He had nothing else, but he had a VHS video recorder and other new gadgets. So I remember seeing, i uh, gone to a video store, which was no video stores, it was a post office with porno movies above. <laughs> and it was... Definitely uh, didn't influence your latest film. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> but then, then it was uh, The Deer Hunter. And the the Cuckoo's oh, Nest, uh, Camino. and all those yeah. movies. It was always there was maybe ten titles. So I yeah. watched, started watching the Deer Hunter. I started watching De Niro movies. I started watching Scorsese movies. Um, and before you know it, um, when I went to London, then I would go to the the the, the Prince Charles Theatre. I'd go to Brixton, uh, Cinema in Brixton, the the, the Ritzy, and I'd start watching old Nieters, Scorsese, and 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 uh, Nicholas Roge. You know, so I'd see them in the cinema. You know, um, all those kind of classics, Nabel Ferreira. Um, oh, we're big Abel fans. Oh, we, I love Abel Ferreira. Miss, Miss Forty Five. We covered Miss Forty Five. Yeah, That's a I love, terrific, terrific little film. I love his films, even if he's even the even the films that are not great. I love his films because I, I, I like I like the, the the spirit of filmmakers rather than I'll forgive them if they do the bad film because I like them. If you know what I mean. They were trying to attempt. Yeah. They're attempting something. They're experimental. They're trying things they yeah. want to fail. You know, um, I, do, I don't like filmmakers that know willing to fail. You know. They do the same thing over and over. They're just safe. Yeah, I've, I've like I've watched a number of your like a number of your shorts and things like that. And you talk about like your Scorsese's and your De Niro's. And I've noticed you know you you quite often have films with like ga- uh, gangs and gangsters and the kind of criminal <laughs> underworld. So it's so that's kind of material you naturally gravitate toward. Have you always been interested, or were you just kind of introduced to it through like the Scorsese and De Niro films? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. It's not so much the gangster influence. It's more to do with. It's more to do with um, crime in general. Crime is, a, 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 you know, you want to get away from gangs. If you look at the news every day where it's politicians, that's crime. There's crime happening every day. Do you know what I mean? Um, but but some of this, the past stuff that I've done where you've got a bigger vision for something, but you can't do it with the budgets you've got. So I started to write the novels. Mm. Like the, the, the idea with the crime rating criminal, I didn't want to just do a gangster film that everybody else does, hitting people in nightclubs and women and pole dancers. So when I did this little yeah. thing called Crime Lord, I wanted to do something that you can personalise, where the guy's a writer, and he comes, no, he's an ex-criminal, he comes out of prison and he starts writing, um, but he can't, everybody's writing, and he can't go yeah. anywhere down that road. So he starts going back into a criminal enterprise, but he starts putting in his writing as if it's fiction. And then he yeah. builds a criminal. So that's more of a novel that I'm doing, the, the, the real version of the cheap. But the reason I made the, the, the no-budget crime films was actually just to learn the process of filmmaking. Right. You know, but you're still doing it in a genre that you I like, you know, kind of crime stuff, you know. But I like genre stuff. I, put it this way. Mark Scorsese, Abel Ferreira, all those people, right? John Cassavetes as well. I'm a big fan oh, of John Oh, John Cassavetes is the, one of my favourite films. The Colony of Chinese Bookie is one of my favourite films. Yeah, Top 50, film. you know, um, which nobody liked at the time. Um, <laughs> but I also like the flip side of that, which is um, Roger Corman, you know, an exploitation filmmakers and Mario Bavis. I like that fantasy, that exploitation, which those guys that Mark Scorsese started off as Francis Ford Coppola started with Coppola and all those guys. So I like that side where you can well, make... Well, Jack Nicholson you know, too. Jack, Jack Nicholson, Nicholson and Jonathan Roger Demme and, and Ron Howard, yeah. you know, the whole lot of them. So I like that side. So that's probably where this latest kind of, you know... So it's jumping from... Because I put it this way. People can say, do you like gritty um, reality? And I love Mean Streets. So that's, mean Streets is one of my favourite films, Trivial right? Film, yeah. But, at the, that's great but at the same time, as we all love Taxi Driver, Taxi Driver is still a kind of weird sort of... This guy's living in his head. It's also weird, it's a surreal film, even though it's very gritty and real. So I like gritty reality and crime, but it's very surreal. And I like sort of surreal... The same as The Sopranos was very kind of surreal, where Tony would go off and he's, you know, he's... 
you know, his dream sequences and his, you know. Um, well, and, there's a philosophy to it. It's not just mere, you know, exploitation of the streets. It's it's saying yeah, something. And like exactly. you're saying about taxi driver, that's you know that comes into Paul Trader's God's Lonely Man world. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's there's thought. There's a theme. There's a politic behind the the meaning. Well, I used to I used to see Taxi Driver in the what was the theatre in uh, the cinema in King's Cross. Um, the big there's a big cinema in King's Cross that was there for years. You see all nighters, and I must have seen Taxi Driver about twenty five yeah. times. And then you come <laughs> through London, and you would start to feel like Travis Bickle, especially when I was yeah. living on my own. <laughs> and you did, and you could just feel that you could maybe go yeah. out. Maybe yeah. that was just me. <laughs> Hey, well, <laughs> well, Martin, Martin Scorsese recently just said that every he didn't realize how much everybody is turned into a Travis Bickle. Everybody yeah. seems like mm. one one push away from going because you know, crazy. Because narcissism and and and, yeah. and so, sort of self centered, and they're in their own wee worlds. And yeah, but yeah, but but my point I'm trying to make is when I watched those movies, I started to think, why are people like that? What what happens to them? Watching Raging Bulls, why did they turn out that way? And I watched Raging Bull, and people think Raging Bull it's a boxing movie. It's gonna do with boxing, really. It's it's to do with people taking money and taking a dive yeah. you know Matt Scott says he didn't really want to make that movie but then he realised it's like the studios he was taking money for the studios and he wasn't doing what he wanted to do you know so that's what the movie's about it's not really about boxing so any movie that you do like even you know the, the one I'm doing the moment it's not really about what it seems there's another element in there as a filmmaker. You have to try as a filmmaker. You have to try and find your personal zone in there, and then wrap in this sort of exploitation. Corman, you know, <laughs> every ten pages is blood. Every ten pages is about sex. Yep. Every day, you know. Otherwise, you don't get an audience. Do you know what I mean? But um, so, yeah, we talked a while ago. But um, we were talking about Herschel Gordon Lewis. You talked yep. about you know great splatter exploitation filmmakers. We talked about Two Thousand Maniacs. I don't know if you see that. These like city folk. They go to this you know deep south town and they're having this big celebration and blood and guts ensues basically. And it's one of those films you can look at on the surface and think it's just a kind of basic exploitation film. But then you look deeper. It's about like sins of the past and the kind of division of the country that was in the Civil War. So I think a lot of people do dismiss these exploitation films offhand, but I think a lot of them do have a lot more to say than you would think if you just looked at them like at surface value. What's the layers and the themes be- behind what you're saying? Because obviously there's the, there's the surface story and then there's the themes, there's the politicking of the piece. And this brings me to what I was going to say. Look, me and Wayne, we're ex- inspiring writers. And a lot of our audience are inspiring to write, whether that's screenplays, fictions, you know, what, what's in line with what you're doing? So what gives you this push? What, why do you think you have to be the author of your own story? Is it the easiest way to get material made, do you find? I think I never started off as a filmmaker. I started off as a script writer. Right. So I, I didn't want to make movies to make movies and find scripts. It started off with the scripts for me. Yeah. Because I was frustrated as an actor, so I'd just sit and write my own scripts, and I never thought they'd be made or whatever. Because I used to send it to the BBC, and I used to get feedback in London for the BBC yeah. before I did my first film. So it was mainly a, a cathartic thing, a writing yeah. things. It wasn't like I want to be a writer. It wasn't I want to be famous. It was catharsis. It was like I need to spew this stuff out that I see in London or whatever. Yeah. So I think it's mainly to do with that. I think if you're after awards, if you're after whatever, I think put it this way if people could say to me if you could go back would you change the path or what you were doing going to something else possibly right because it's a hard life but you get right. to a certain point when you go you've got no choice you have to keep doing this and when you look at the world every day and all the bad news and all the bad shit you need some sort for me you need some sort of cathartic thing that you can yeah. we're thinking on twitter and raw rat and saying this is all yeah. terrible which does nothing <laughs> does nothing yeah. you're better creating some a piece of art piece of music where the uh Bands in the sixties and seventies with protest with music, um, which are yeah, big Dylan, yeah. exactly. So um, it's a cathartic thing. It's not a sort of I want to write to be a filmmaker. Or it's it's yeah. something you just need to do. Do you know what I mean? Well, you've been doing this over two decades now. What is your writing routine? Because many of us who are you know you want we want to pursue this. You know, we're given to folly. We're given to fatigue. What keeps you going? What is? Do you have a writing routine? Um, no, I don't have a writing routine. Right. What what I do is. Um, I don't sit and write a script and look at a cursor flashing. Um, if I get an idea, <laughs> then I, I, for years I had hundreds of ideas. I'd file them away, go right, and then I'd sift them, go, that's rubbish. Where the, oh, Jesus, where'd I get that one? I was drinking that night before they'd been that, you know. <laughs> hey, like, some of the best ideas come Some way. of the best ideas, but some of the really <laughs> bad ones, you know. Mind um, lubrication. Yeah. yeah. But then then you get, you go, and then you look at the last ones, and then you go, right, oh, there's something there, you know. Um, 
Right. In fact, take take. I'm not plugging Psycho Sex Dolls. We can come to that later for a wee plug. Oh yeah. But, but this is a good example. Um, sometimes I'll come up with. A, sometimes I hear a, p- a piece of music and I'll think of a scene. I'll think of a character and I go, all right, who is that? And then it'll. It's me. I mainly write when I'm walking about the park. You know, I write when I'm walking because I don't have any thoughts in my head in terms of social media, whatever. If I'm and I've got the phone, and then I'll just start talking into the phone. I'll either talk mm. a scene or I'll either talk an idea. And before I know it, after a few weeks, then if I've got the if the audio was full of it, three hundred hundred notes, then I go, there's something there, right. you know. Um, and then when I write the script, it usually takes a few days because I've I've spent time in. Um, I've got to be seduced. Like the, it's almost. I remember hearing an interview. Uh, even though I'm not a big Quentin Tarantino fan, but I remember hearing an interview with Quentin Tarantino say it would put up a. Ra- it would put, it's almost like putting a radar up, and <clears throat> I'll do. And then when you get the characters, they start talking to each other, and the thing starts writing itself. That's when it comes <laughs> best. But it does. That's so you need when to ruminate starts. on. You need the rumination period. You mm. need it's like sown little seeds. You know, like say Psycho Sex Dolls. I was for a laugh. I told them um, because I had this anthology series called Mad World. I was going to do because it is a mad right. world, right? Yeah. So it was an anthology, eight, 30 minute uh, films, all crazy shit. And Psycho Sex Dolls was one of those anthologies for thirty minutes, right? So when I came up, I just came up with the title. I just came up, I just the title. I just had the title Psycho Sex Dolls. I told one of my friends, and he laughed. I told somebody else, and they <laughs> laughed. I went, "Well, that's no good reaction because it's not meant to be a comedy." <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, uh, it gra- it's a title that grabs you anyway but but my point was it was an emotional reaction for everybody that I told mm. in some way they went Jesus <laughs> there was some sort of where if you tell other people a title they just go oh it's nice when you go oh right when you make that yeah. if you get some <laughs> sort of reaction whether it's laughter whether it's shock whether it's something then you go oh, right okay there's a title there and what I'd learned at the Cannes Film Festival when I was there in my first movie because you learn a lot of things for your ba- past films I was there with sales agents and uh, one of the right. sales agents Victor who was an old veteran sales agent had done a lot of movies um, in fact he sold the Deer Hunter you know in the 70s um, wow and he was talking really? about hey, David come up with a title and a poster <laughs> just a fucking right. title mate and a poster <laughs> and that's it he was doing he was working with Neil Marshall doing Dog Soldiers at the time and then, oh terrific film uh, I was there with Neil Marshall for a weekend. Yeah. He was yeah. he had the same yeah. producer as me. He was a, Christopher Vick was the same producer as Dog Soldiers, yeah. Yeah. and he was getting pressured. So we used to come up. Okay, so I remember coming up with a title for a movie, and he says, "Go with that fucking guy over there." And, and <laughs> so I, I I'd done a title for a movie just as a laugh, and I went over, yeah. and the guy gave, was going to give me two hundred fifty thousand if I could get two hundred fifty thousand, but I didn't have a movie. So my point I'm trying to make is, I learned for the Cannes Film Festival, and even more today when you get through Netflix and you get through Amazon. And Unless you're Mission Impossible Seven with Tom Cruise's face, then you've got yeah. to have a quick poster. The you need a tagline. You need something to tagline. <clears throat> now, I, 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 I'd be remiss here, David. You, you've mentioned Cannes Film Festival several times. Now, can you say to us mere peasants, what is the experience? <laughs> what is the experience of Cannes Film Festival like to anybody who's not been there? Is it hectic? Is it is? On the moment, do you need to be have your wits about you to sell? Is it all about sales? Is it a quick sales pitch the whole time? It's, it's like a buy and sellers market with buying vegetables and bananas and selling, and it really people think it's this glamorous. They've got the festival thing, you know, right. with Hollywood. They've they've got the festival with the indie movies, right? The European indie movies, and 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 but they've also got the Hollywood that comes with the big blockbusters, which is the big the red carpet stuff. It's so it's all that, but when they go into that build big building, the part of the festival when they go up the stairs, underneath that big building in the basement is all these really kind of B-movies and exploitation movies and then down from the, the, the part of the festival and in, in the hotels is the porn industry as well no, so right, it's, okay. it's, it's basically a buy and sell market where people are buying movies, there's port, like you know, Canon Films, you know Canon Films in yeah, the, the Canon 80s films. So they used to dominate Can. If you've probably seen the documentary, they used to dominate Can in the eighties, and they'd have posters for movies that were never made yet. And can I, can I, can I cans like that? Cans like when I first went there, there'd be a poster with a karate kicking dog, and then there'd be a star space in it. <laughs> right, there'd be some right, and it's like chop suey fucking pat, you know. And and you go what the, f-? and then you see a star space in it. So the movie would be made for about two million. They get a star for half a day, and they'd stick their face in it. And the star would knows that nobody would ever see the movie. <laughs> you know, be like some students that watch it. So it's a it's a combination of really bad movies 
and a combination of Hollywood and art movies. Well, was you Lloyd know. Kaufman with Trauma not like oh, the king of this? The king of oh, this yeah, advertisement. Yeah, yeah. You'd well, take a tanks down the street, for well, example. i got a story about that. I was sitting in that. Oh, a, no, there's a bar, no, there's a bar. No, it's not so much a story. It's just a little... Um, where I first went to Cannes, I'm sitting in a bar, one of the main bars. I forget the name yet, but it's the main bar that all the Brits go to. And then these zombies come flying through the window and smash the window <laughs> and come into the bar, flying through some sort of movie. And I went, what the fuck is that? And they're all, no, the head mask for Nukem High, you know. Yeah. And then somebody says, oh, that's just trauma. That's just that yeah. trauma shit. <laughs> and everywhere I went in Cannes, it was trauma. You know, half-naked women and the zombies. and the So you always knew about trauma at the Cannes Film Festival because there was always a gang of them, you know. I've seen the documentary, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you see, it's like it's a very kind of eclectic environment because over here you have your prestige pieces, but then if you do like a secret knock on this door, you'll get led through into the room with all the exploitation films are showing. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're pre- <laughs> yeah, pretty much in the opening in the hotels, um, but it's a mixture of that, and that's probably. I mean, I haven't been for years. I'll probably be going back this year with this movie if it goes to plan. Mm-hmm. This is the first time. I, I don't like to go to places like that unless I've got something. If yeah. you know what I mean. Um, because I don't like hang out those places. Nothing worse when you're at a festival and you're not there for a reason, you know. You don't want to be the stray no. fart just causing no, a thing. No, because <laughs> many filmmakers that are all going to Cannes, they go there, but they've not got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, good, it's good for a social... You're just like a hanger-on, basically. Yeah, yeah, that, you know. So, But yeah, it's a very interesting place. Um, <laughs> um, it's not like people think it is, um, but it's, it's hardcore yeah. buyer-seller's market, pre-sales and movies. Pre-sale markets mm-hmm. changed a lot since I was there. Movies used to just be pre-sold, but now because when you sell a movie, you're, you're trying to sell it to Netflix or Amazon, so you're not selling it to every territory in the world. You're doing, you know... Well, how, how would you find that's changed over the, your, over your two decades of the industry? Because now it's arguably, in many ways, way more easier to finance a film or content, as it's usually called, because we have different avenues. We have Amazon Prime, we have Netflix. But in many ways, is that burying talent? Because the, the mid-budget film is essentially dead in many aspects. We have the ultra-budget film and we have the extreme low-budget film. So... How do you navigate your place in the cinematic realm currently? Is, and what's changed compared to, you know, 2000 when you had pasty faces? <clears throat> well, everything's changed because um, there's a lot more films made because everybody's got access to making films. But I think the people that are lonely last, it's very it's very grinding. So I, yeah. I think that not everybody's going to make films for their whole life because once they realise that they can't make any money, most people, 90% of people, will die away. I know a lot of filmmakers mm. that just go, geez, I can't handle this, I can't, I'm not making any money, I can't, and they'll die. <clears throat> so that, there's that aspect. But the business has changed so much that for me, the way that I see it is, when I was brought up, I would, sh- <clears throat> I would shine towards not so much the films, but I'd shine towards the filmmakers. When you say the name David Lynch or Woody Allen or Quentin Tarantino or oh, Edel yeah. Ferreira, you have got a, you know right away that instill you know you want to see their movies even if it's bad, good, whatever. If you're a fan of those people, right? And I don't think enough people are today are building their own personal brand. You know, I think you've got to build your personal brand, even if you know, um, if you build your own personal brand and people follow you through your bad movies, through your good movies, through your sort of journey where your story becomes the actual movie as well, you know. Um, because I used to follow off filmmakers and I would... Hey, your, is it Jess Franco, isn't it? Is that how you pronounce his name? Jess, Jess Franco, Franco, the Spanish... Yeah. Yep. Right, Jesus, okay. J- Jesus so, Franco. Yeah, yeah. So we know most of these <laughs> movies are really, you know, like pornos and stuff like that. And, and there's many filmmakers and, and I love John Waters. But you actually, half the mm-hmm. time, I love the... And Andy Milligan, who, you know... The, Andy Milligan, was, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, as a lot of people like the spirit of the filmmaker and they'll follow their journey and then they'll end up buying into their movie or whatever they're doing. So I think you've got to build your own. Today it's very, they can independent world, uh, put it this way, I hate the word, the word indie movie. Scorsese was talking about the other day, right? I hate the word indie movie, even though I use it because it's marketing, right? I fucking hate it because when you used to say indie band or indie movie, it used to mean something subversive. It used to mean something different. But independent movies always existed because Fed would, right? That was an independent movie, right? But you can take Francis Ford Coppola today that he's funded his independent movies for Apocalypse Now to his recent 100 million movie self. That's an independent movie. So mm. um, every almost every movie is an independent movie, but people go support independent movies. Well, that means everybody. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't yeah. mean anything. It doesn't, you know. So what I'm trying to say is you have got to find, navigate your way through this noise 
to try and build your own personal brand and sta- and, and innovate as well. Innovate, you know. Right, well, Indi- in- Independent lost its appeal, didn't it? Or lost its cachet because it became a an aesthetic rather than a, you know, a, a way of releasing film. Independent film in the 70s where your Easy Riders or all those movies that, that we know that we love and the independent films in the 90s yeah. came alive yeah. with your Tarantinos. That world doesn't really exist anymore, you know. That no, it was world... corporatized, yeah. Yeah, the problem is it's too. You think it's like too studio controlled because I remember someone saying at one point there's only two brand names in the cinema world and that's Disney and Spielberg. So you have you have to be this biggest brand or you have to be this big name director. But for indie films, we're talking like Steven Soderbergh when he did like Sex Lies and Videotape, and that helped kick off the whole '90s boom, which we've talked about. We've spoken of our reverence for that before. So yeah, the problem is everybody is an indie filmmaker, but the term. The thing, the term has just been corrupted over time. Or, or Cassavetes, who would literally mortgage a house to get a film made. He was the king. I mean, he was yeah. the king of independent films. Um, but but Hollywood has actually got what they wanted because Hollywood, when they gave the power to your Dennis Hopper's after Easy Rider, oh, Dennis yeah. the last put movie, up, put, put up his nose. And was, yeah. <laughs> you got, I love Dennis Hopper. I love Dennis Hopper. Hey, the last movie's a great film as well. It yeah, have yeah. His career. Yeah, but these guys, they, they, they got a lot of power. You know, at that time, so the studios didn't like that. They yeah. took that away. It kind of came back in the nineties. But what the studios always wanted to do, the studios always wanted to get really get rid of the visionary directors, so they can control everything. And actually, they've done it because if you look, put it this way, right? If you look at the blockbusters and other superhero movies, right? Hollywood wants indie filmmakers with a vision, right? They want right. a vision. They want a visionary indie filmmaker. But what do they do when they get that indie filmmaker that's got a vision? They, they, they'll give them a hundred million or fifty million, and then they'll 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 lie on the flat. It's almost like what's that mm. filmmaker, that British filmmaker? I had somebody ranting about, you know, in Freight Fest ranting about him. Uh, ben, what's his name? Ben. Uh, that done. Ben Wheatley. Ben Wheatley, right? Because he done the shark movie, right? The, the shark sequel in the Meg Two, right? They saying, "Oh, he's a seller. He's this. He's that." Right? Nay, visionary director. Hollywood takes him. Like every many other directors, and you get a big blockbuster and whatever. I can understand the other side of that because most filmmakers don't actually, even if they've got success, don't earn a lot of money. So if you get that mm-hmm. thrown in front of your desk, you'll fuck it. I need to pay the mortgage. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, we've we've said this before. People talk about you know getting all high and mighty, and oh, I would never bow down to Hollywood, etc. But if someone comes along and says, right, we want you to make this movie. Here's a hundred million dollars for it, and you'll get a big cut. You're not going to say no because in your mind you could think, okay, I could take the profits I'm going to get this for this film. I could finance ten of my own projects like our very first our very first episode was Kill List which was a Ben Wheatley film you look at that then you look at the Meg 2 completely different made in completely different circumstances yeah and but people don't seem to realise I mean I was talking to um, I'm no name drop uh, Julie, Al Pacino's daughter Julie Pacino on a podcast recently and e- oh. even she couldn't get um, she's made her first movie funded by NFTs you know before the NFTs took a dive recently yeah yeah, yeah. right <laughs> yeah. so she funded her first movie she went to the studios and she go and you know and she couldn't even get what we were t- basically what we were talking about was that if somebody wants to give you money, industry wants to give you money, right? They basically don't want the visionary. They want somebody that's had success, but they want a they want a captain of the ship um, mm-hmm. that can just be the captain of the ship. But don't bring your vision because we've already got the CGI teams worked out. The, the shots have been worked out. Everyone's been worked out. You just need to be the person with the energy, you know, that steers the ship. After speaking to Al Pacino's daughters, you're definitely slumming it now, David. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, well, this yeah, is it's, great, it's, guys. It's, this is this is one of the best uh, chats I've had. You know, We're talking about filmmaking. You know, it's 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 very true. But you say about someone says, you know, I won't bow down to Hollywood. And oh, if they gave me a twenty million dollar check, I'd never say yes to that because that would be selling out. The kind of people who say that have never been given a twenty million yeah. dollar check before. Oh yeah, so that's obvious why they would say something. It's easy to be kind of like high and mighty and righteous if you would never be put in that situation. So how easy to, is it to get dissuaded, David? Because I know after many years in filmmaking, you transitioned into the commercial aspect of filmmaking, whether that's business filmmaking. What is that like? How is it to go from the high of thinking, okay, I'm making pasty faces here i am i'm filming la i'm filming las vegas then several years later after self-funding for many years you're in the commercial aspect what what is that transition like for somebody who wants to be the author of their own work i don't really think in the commercial aspect i think it put it this way right 
I've continued to make my own smaller films, but I'm trying to find a way that you can more like this new film that you yep. can make posters and sell products as well, and you know because you're not making money from the actual no. film, you can make money from the the red band uh, version, the of merchandise and uh, merchandise stuff like that, right? But the the reason I'm doing this as well, I'm trying to get bigger movies as well. I'm not trying to get the the Meg two meter whatever i've got a 30 million <laughs> i've got a solid solid 30 million script and try to get to jerry butler right, right. um nay yeah. hollywood doesn't want original scripts they don't no. want that but what they do want is they want a tried and tested uh, genre film with a different spin on it so like, they want the I formula see- yeah, if, yeah, so yeah, if I say I've got a movie, I've got a movie called The Vipers, right? And it's eight guys and gals on a mission movie, right? But there's a different... Nobody's ever seen these characters right. before. Never, Nobody's ever seen this universe before, this world. So then they kind of like that sort of movie. So for me, I'm just starting to move into that to try and get budgets. But at the same time, the reason I'm continuing with my no-budget films is because I've had the experience of the first one. Example, say somebody gave me 30 million to make the movie, right? And I go and I'm on the set to make the movie and I'm getting bullshit everywhere and I'm getting, yep. you can't do this, you can't do that. Yep. If I already started building more me fan base, I go, do you know what? I ain't never shit. I'm going back home. You know, <laughs> the worst thing that you can have is desperation to make a movie, you know. So if you don't have desperation, um, then you're more likely to get what you want, you know. Now, what is it you learned in the interim? What is it you learned from 2000? What is it you learned in that space from then till now? What is it you're learning to navigate with the producers, the financers? What is the confidence you gather? What is it you're learning to navigate your own path? I think the, I think I learned one thing that over the years, when again when I made my first movie, I didn't know what most people done. Right. right, I can take it. I can take now. It's very small film, right? But I can take an idea in my head in my room, and I can get it to Apple TV or or, or Amazon, whatever, on a small level. That's quite unique, like for writing, directing, producing, whatever. It's not because I'm a megalomaniac. It's because you have to, <laughs> no, you have to do these things yourself to start to right. get that. I think, and I remember seeing an interview with Christopher Nolan talking about when he was first doing his corporate videos. He learned how he, the lenses, he learned about the the, the the audio, he learned about the crew and the lighting and everything, and that helped him on big movies. And I think that's a really important thing that people don't realise. So that for years I've been learning all this stuff and learning every single right. aspect and learning to do posters and fly drones and write the scripts so that people then do employ people that have got a kind of... it. So that if I do get a budget, then I know everybody's jobs so well that I respect their jobs. I didn't respect their jobs mm-hmm. in the first movie. I didn't know who the hell we were. <laughs> I didn't know no, you're, you're just finding your feet. I just find my feet. Yeah. Right. So what I'm trying to say is... You can't just go out there and start. You've got to. You've got to. You've got to be prepared to fail. You know, I'm a big fan of Orson Welles, right? Oh and yeah. I think right. Now he made his masterpiece, we know, and his career went on. He ended up doing unfinished movies, and he ended up doing movies where he's with Tim Brooke Taylor for the, the, the you know, <laughs> um, and and all sorts of quirky little things. Or his wine and, advert. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I love that wine advert. Yeah, but what the point I'm trying to make is that he done his masterpiece at the start. I think it makes more sense that if you spend years doing a lot of crap to learn the process and to find your voice yep. and your vision, so that before you die, you maybe you maybe have built uh, enough experience and enough audience and enough um, clout to then make your masterpiece before you go, rather than the opposite way, you know. Yep. Um, I mean, he has a, he, I saw you talking about um, Quentin Tarantino with Jackie Brown, and you know, mm-hmm. um, Nate, look, Quentin Tarantino, we you know, is one of the best filmmakers in the world. There's no question of that, whatever, right? I was a big fan of him at the start with Reservoir Dogs, and I'm a, for me personally, Jackie Brown's his best movie, you know. Um, mm. Elmore the, Leonard. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is, he says, "Don't want to make any more films." He drops the mic and he's done all these movies, right? This is not criticizing, but but <clears throat> this is why I like Abel Ferreira and those guys. When you've been in the Hollywood system, you're afraid to take risks. You're afraid to fail. You're afraid you want to mm. protect your legacy. You know, oh, I've not had many failures. I think it's so important to fail. Casavetti's done movies where he feel, you know, all these mo- filmmakers that see Steven Soderbergh will do films and phones that he's done. You know, to experiment. Mm. I think that's really important. Not to protect yourself. Even me doing a oh, dude, what are you doing a Psycho Six Dolls for? You're not doing a crime movie, well, because I, I need to even fail. I need to yeah. even try and do things different so that I'm not putting in a little box and go, I know that guy. Oh, shit, I don't know. Yeah. You know. What do you think about Quentin Tarantino ending after 10 films? As somebody who's indebted to film himself, can you give up that passion? Does it ever end? I can't understand this because he's so in tuned with the c- cinematic experience 
and his personal life is all one and the same. How does he just give that up after 10 films? Well, I think he's such a big movie buff that I think he'll spend the rest of his time doing movie books about movie filmmaking right. and filmography and all that stuff and and, and, not, and writing novels. I can yeah. understand the attraction yeah. for writing novels because I've started writing novels because you get total creative control. Yeah, It's kind of ironic that Quentin Tarantino knows every exploitation crappy genre movie it's ever been made <laughs> but you know I would love to have seen him just experiment and do a movie for five million dollars and it could turn yeah. it crap but he's experimented if you know what I mean but he's got the yep. Quentin Tarantino brand to protect well he tried to do that with Death Proof didn't he but he, he, did. he, um, he almost couldn't get out the way of his own film <laughs> Like, yeah. this could have been this almost exploitation masterpiece, but it's still fundamentally a Quentin Tarantino I think film. you get... It's a, I, mean, it's a, you know, I don't like to criticise, you know, incredibly successful filmmakers, but we could still criticise, you know, I think in the second yeah. half of Death Proof with the, the, when the, the females yeah. were talking, it was very Quentin Tarantino dialogue, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. I think the first half was great. I loved the I first think, half. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. it kind of went, and I think he knows that when he made it, I think he'd realised that afterwards. But the concept was great, having a slashing yeah. movie with a car, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, Mickey, Mick, Mick, um, Mickey Rourke was first place, was yeah. first choice to play the stuntman. That would that would have been extremely interesting. Kurt Russell was terrific, yeah. but Mickey Rourke would have been a fantastic choice. I can see the, the reason for Mickey Rourke, yeah. absolutely, you know. Yeah. Um, I, th I think as well what you say about the the thing with someone like Tarantino is how a lot of these big names are kind of insulated from criticism. This is a big problem I have where, say you criticise the Tarantino film, people wouldn't say, oh, but that film is such and such. They'll be like, oh, no, that's a Tarantino film. Like, you're not allowed to say anything negative against these filmmakers. So do you think that's another thing that also motivates them to kind of avoid risk because they say, I can make I can make kind of anything and people will praise it because it's got my name on it. I, I can understand it in one way that if you're a, like myself, if you're no known and you're going to make something, you actually don't really give a shit if anybody likes it or not. <laughs> you don't. I honestly yeah. don't care. That's not my, my... I don't care if somebody... It's subjective, right? But see, if you're very successful and you get a hundred million for a studio, I would. It's not that I care what anybody thinks. I want to protect their investment, right? Do you know what I mean? I don't want it to be ripped apart so they lose their money because it's a huge money. It's a huge gamble. So I think that aspect I'd be slightly. But when you're done it, the, the, the no budget, a smart, tiny budget, I don't really care. But he's dealing. With, he's he's a, you know he's a, he's an icon. You know, for you there's like it's like less pressure and less expectations yeah. if you're doing it on your own. If you're because you talked about for about Robert Rodriguez and we covered El Mariachi and it was incredible reading like the most fascinating aspect of the film for us for me at least were how we managed to make it like if he had a like a steady cam shot he'd get someone to like push him in a yeah. wheelchair things like this. So like for you David you've you know written and directed and produced but as you said before you're an actor and this is someone I've always wanted to ask someone what's it like as a director to direct yourself because you acted in uh, I was watching a few clips from Crime Lord I believe it mm -hmm. was where you play mm -hmm. the, the gangster and the writer what's it like the process of directing yourself in a film well the first reason I cast myself it wasn't so much because I've been acting it wasn't so much I was desperate to play the part I, I could rely on myself mm -hmm. because I knew it would take a few years <laughs> to make so yeah. you can always be fun out act, fun out with actors so but in terms of <laughs> in terms of actually directing yourself there's always that line with Clint Eastwood. He always goes, well, that, he does a take, and he goes, well, that's my usual adequate self, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think Pauline Kael was a fan of Clint Eastwood, was she? <laughs> no, I don't think she did like it. Yeah. Like he said he was, he was, like, very stiff and very... He couldn't have... Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Robotic. But, but in a way, that there's many director-actors. I mean, John Cazavet, he's his act, you know, and, and, and George Clooney's act. There's many actor-directors... Um, so I think yeah, it's it's not the ideal situation, but you can, uh, in a way, you can get into them if you focus in the moment. It's it's right. better to like this latest one. I'm no acting in it. I just want to focus purely on the thing. Um, mm. But the good thing about being an actor filmmaker is. Um, which a lot of filmmakers don't get, and this is why I think there's a lot of success. Woody Allen acting in his movies and whatever. He's always he's always Woody. He's Allen, always Woody course. Allen, yeah. Uh, right, <laughs> right. But but there's a lot of success. John Caz, uh, Favreau is acting. You know, there's a lot. But the thing is, you understand the process of acting. Right. You know, so you understand how to set an environment for the actors. A lot of uh, directors are very Ridley Scott admitted this at first. He didn't know how to deal with actors at first. Um, mm. It doesn't matter what the technical process is. If you don't get a nice playground for the actors to play in, and you don't have to worry about the technical, you're not going to get good performances. So as an actor, I think the advantage is you know what buttons to push in actors. You know how to set an environment for them. You know how to get the best out of them. Um, uh, that's one of the. I mean, that wasn't the question for me. Just acting <laughs> and the thing, but in a way, um, 
it, it helps with, put it this way for me directing myself in a way because I'm editing myself yeah. <laughs> you can chop out all the bad bits I can take all the shit away right? hey David so, you're preaching to the converted here you know <laughs> we know well about exactly, that. Yeah, exactly with the podcast you know so I might I might have really you know three takes that are really bad but I might fart out one that's good yeah. you know and I go I'm having that one I'm having that look because I'm editing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm like that. See, when we're recording this, see if we're recording an episode, Liam and I, and I'm the one editing because we alternate, you know, like one, uh, he'll edit one week, I'll edit the next week. And like, if I make a mistake, I think to myself, I get excited. I'm like, I cannot wait to go through <laughs> the edit and cut that screw up out. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, like I say, it's cathartic. It's liberating. It's like, you know, you, you can you can go on, you can mess up, like you say, a playground for the actors, and then you just cut it down afterwards. Well, that's why I learned to edit as well. And I learned to do my camera because when I was in America, I was making a horror movie in America, I fell out with the camera guys. So I learned, <laughs> I learned how to use the camera within forty hours, and I knew the shots that I wanted. And then I learned the editing because just controlling things and try to control the vision of things. Don't get me wrong; if I had budgets yep. these days, I'd have the best cameraman, I'd have the best editor. Um, so yeah, in terms of so the original question was acting and directing because I can edit myself. That helps yep. a lot, you know. How would you feel navigating different genres as a filmmaker? Is it hard transitioning from crime to horror, for example? Because I know your first horror film was called Screen. And I yeah. I've got I've got to say, <laughs> David, I love its tagline. It says, in 1972, a group of grindhouse movie fans mysteriously died at a drive-in theatre. In 2012, it happened again. <laughs> that is straight out the Roger Corman school of yeah, filmmaking. Yeah. Mm. So how how hard is it navigating between crime to horror to whatever genre you're making? I don't think it matters. We, we you can back to Quentin Tarantino. There are people like that they navigate. Look at Stanley Kubrick went for horror to all sorts True, of things, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, look at uh, the guy done the Exorcist. They went to create, you know, uh, freaking William Freakin. You know, you always say, I always you sometimes feel like an imposter when you're going to do horror because you see all these filmmakers that do horror all the time. They're horror filmmakers, but I just look at yeah. the directors that done horror that weren't horror directors. The Alien mm-hmm. is like a horror thriller, right. but it Ridley was. Scott is not horror. Director. Director. I think you can mm. come through it for a different angle that you're not completely, in, you know, in yep. love with horror all the time. So you just come through it for a story angle. But for me, what I learned in screen was, even though it was a very no budget movie, um, what I learned was atmospheric. Yep. And if you're a filmmaker, you want to get the kind of De Palma dress to kill thing. You want to get more visual. You want to get more cinematic. Mm-hmm. So the horror genre mm-hmm. is really good for just... When I was doing the screen, it was a lot more cinematic, hanging about with the two actresses in, the, in a firebird car driving across Oklahoma with some music. That was really attractive, rather than having dialogue yeah. over a table with characters all the time, mm-hmm. like a series. So this is why I wanted to get back to this other film and have it very visual and cinematic. And So as a filmmaker, it doesn't matter what genre it is, a filmmaker always wants to do something that's more cinematic, and a lot of filmmakers to do work on television where they're doing serials, it's no cinematic, it's just people talking. So the horror genre really is attractive for that, um, but for me it's also about what you don't see. You know, this yep. is this film that I've got is a very kind of sexy film, but it, horror and sex are closely related because if you put somebody in a room and you hear a chainsaw and somebody getting chopped up, <laughs> but you can only hear screams, right? Yeah. That can be more horrific. If you see a couple in a room having sex on a bed and you just hear the moans and the sex, that can be more erotic. Sometimes what mm. you don't see is, you know... Um, so I think it's related in a way, but in terms of horror, is attractive for kind of cinema appeal. And, al- and also back to the kind of Roger Corman thing where you want to make a movie that can... Hey, I don't think every movie is an exploitation movie. All the Bond movies are exploitation well, movies. Pretty much, I, I, I mean, think so as well. Not just the 70s ones, but were obviously exploitation movies, yeah. but I mean, even the modern day ones, right? 10 pages, you get an action scene, you get this. Mission Impossible, it's all exploitation. Uh... Well, they're essentially B movies blown up to an A picture. Yeah, of course. Yeah. This is, this is... Exploitation is just like taking a certain genre, taking a certain aspect of, you know, a theme, yeah, and course. then essentially just blowing it up. Of, of course. I mean, look, you know, I'm not criticising Tom Cruise. He's one of the biggest movie, best movie stars in the world, right? We all love Tom Cruise and Mission Impossibles and whatever. But I get a little bored um, when I hear <laughs> that Tom jumped over this ramp with a motorcycle. <laughs> if I think, yeah. Right, right. And he's, like, he's such a risk taker. But he's not done any risky movies for years. There are no risky mm-hmm. movies. This is a different conversation. But there's no risky movies. <laughs> what would what would be the last one? Eyes Wide Shut, maybe? He used to do tons of great yeah, movies yeah. that were all the you know, and knew it's like there's zero risk because of, but that's a different that's a different yeah. But what I'm talking about, um so h- horror or genre or exploitation film, to me is all part and parcel. Uh, you go back to Quentin Tarantino, I mean he's jump fe uh, like you get some people that want to put a message in a movie. Uh, where it's Ken Loach and they make a message movie yeah. which is great and then you want to do that and it's all there 
But for me, if you're trying to get into the movie realm, you should try and get your message and your theme. Like I'm trying to do with this other film, you get a theme of AI today. Because I think the best horrors sometimes reflect the times that we live in. Where it was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah, reflected the Manson family or the, the Atomic yeah. Cage or... Um, so if you can, if you've got a message with, that you don't want to hit people over the head with, you can wrap it like sugar, you know, sugar coat it. <laughs> well, that's what's good with a horror genre. You can hide it under subtext. Exactly. And you, you said know. before about you know the horror community can, can sometimes be sort of cliquey, and you can feel imposter syndrome. Now, could you have at the start of your career made a horror as your first film, or do you think that would have pigeonholed you and put you off from making a horror film? No, I don't think I could have, because right. I, even though my first movie was a silly caper movie, the other films, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into character-driven films, like, again, your Cassavetes killing a Chinese bookie. Yeah, I yeah. still want to do a movie that's, like, hanging out with characters. Um, I still want to do those kind of movies as well, so I don't, I, you know, my my ground base is to do with characters. I think it's the acting background as well. Right. I think it's got to be surrounded by that. Um, so, but but what I do like about the horror community is they're so enthusiastic. You go to festivals; mm. they just yeah. love the movies. You have an ingrained audience already, a built-in audience. People people will go. Like, is there any other genre where people will go to a screening dressed up as various characters from the genre, for example? Yeah, whereas there's a lot of um, filmmakers that take themselves incredibly serious and their obsession to win an award at BAFTA or whatever, and it becomes very kind of stiff and very kind of. Whereas you yeah. just want to hang about with people that have fun with the, the with the, the movie. You know what I mean? Do you think you've learned that attitude by going through the motions? Was there a time when you thought, "Look, I really want to be the award winning director. I want to be making important pictures. I want to be saying something. I want to be an auteur. I want to be t saying these important pieces of the time." Um, I pro I've, I've got scripts like that in me, but I need um, sort of freedom. If I've got some money behind me, almost like your way Gary, Gary Oldman did now by mouth with his own money. Right. I think if you want to do something that nobody will watch, right, mm -hmm. then you need some money, right? Yeah. So even if you're shooting films and phones these days. But one thing that I did learn was I remember doing my first movie and I was I, I couldn't edit. Um, it wasn't a movie. It was a trailer to try and get the movie done. And I was sitting beside somebody that was uh, helping me and she was uh, she wanted to win an award and she was going on about it. And I says, look, Elizabeth, it's just a formula, everybody else. I says, Scottish Green is a formula. I says, I'll show you, right? I'll, I'll, let me do this. I wrote a little script. I says, shoot it in black and white. Shoot it in a video camera. Shoot it in black and white. It's got to be through the eyes of a child. It's got to mm -hmm. be the father's a drunk. The child, it's through uh -huh. his perspective. But, but cut a long story short, I'm not being a, trying to be a smart <laughs> ass here, but cut a long story short, I submitted, she submitted, she shot the film in my script, right? I never took any credit for whatever. And then she won some Evening Times Award as the new filmmaker with a new voice, and then Scottish Screen started those. And then, <laughs> but I'd done that as a, a, a gimmick. You know, no, you're absolutely right. Like you know, you know, you talk about Oscar bait, like the kind yeah. of films that, like, like someone, I think they kind of worked out a formula. They took one film, I think it was called "Come See the Paradise," and they worked out that's the most Oscar baity film ever because, like, it took place during the war. There was like a Holocaust setting. The lead character worked in the film industry. It was very long at a very slow pace. So it's like you're basically just ticking a whole bunch of boxes so you can win an award. You're not making the film you want to make. Well, you're making the kind aye. of film that you think that awards that you know award boards want to see francis Ford coppola is on instagram right because of his latest movie and he tweeted something a few weeks ago about the movie business not being a sport and i've always said that right a lot of filmmakers that i've seen out there it's almost like they're in the olympics they've got to win yeah. a bafta they've got to. Mm -hmm. if you're in sports there's a winner, there's a second place, there's a third. That's just a fact. If you yep. cross the line, you win. If you cross second, you win. In the movie business, it's become such a competition with awards that it's become a competition that's sports. So people are mm. desperately win. And they that and it takes away the creativity. It's it's like it's yeah. subjective. Some people will hate your movie, some people will love it. Right. You know. You know. Mm -hmm. And it should be it, it kills your freedom, you know. So I don't have any desire for awards in that sense, you know. And that brings us to contemporary times, David, and the film you are kickstarting, crowdfunding, <laughs> psycho sex dolls. Why don't you give? <laughs> you why go. don't you give us all a little synopsis? <laughs> what? What? What is this film about? What are you trying to achieve? Well, when I first done it, I told you guys it was just a title, and I go, okay, yeah, what, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. is there a movie there? And I go, okay, so what's this sex dolls shit, right? Okay, so, <laughs> so then I come up with, and it, something's choosing you, know, it won't go away, you like, try to get rid of it, because yeah. it's like, I don't want that, you know. Um, cut a long story short, I go, okay, what, what is these dolls, you know, there's this filmmaker, 
And I go, okay, filmmaker, that's close to me, but I don't want to just make a filmmaker as boring. Okay, he's a trashy, mm -hmm. Ed Woody porno filmmaker. That yeah. makes it a little bit more colourful, right? Okay, he's got his own studio. He's lost all his actresses because uh, they're all doing only fans. He doesn't pay them well. He doesn't treat them well. He's not evolving. He's still living in the 90s when he used to sell DVDs. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of interesting. He's not evolving because a lot of people are not evolving in the film business. Yeah. That makes it personal to me, right? So I get more into it. It's more like a personal movie. Right, how can I uh, genre up? Okay, so, um, and then one day he, he finds online his financer is cutting his money if, because you, you know you you you've done jug set you know big jug seventeen we can't make any more shit you know <laughs> um, it's like you know it comes with big jugs eighteen you know so. Um, he gives him 48 hours, basically, that he's got to come up with some innovative, do a reality show on here called Big Brother, Big Buster Brother, whatever the fuck, do something to make money with content, adult yeah. content. Cut long story short, he's, he's, he, he, a company contacts him online and says about these new AI sex dogs, and he sees them online, and they look really real, and he thinks it's fake, yep. because they're like real women, they're not like dogs, you know. Um, like Westworld, um, Westworld's been done, but you try to do your own angle yep. on it. Anyway, cut long story short, he gets him on a beta version, which is no good. <laughs> you know, he gets a test version prototype, gets him for a weekend. The financer comes there, sees him, can't, he can't believe it. That he's, cut long story short, he gets them all to make their own films, their only fans in his studio, and they're making these porno movies and they're making their only fans. The filmmaker's making a fortune, the financer's making a fortune. But one of the dogs has got the wrong chip. She's got a chip that's really advanced. Oh, so as right. this time goes on, yeah. she's starting to learn. She's been exploited. She's getting taken the piss out of her. But she goes a long way. There's a lot of fun stuff up there because the dogs dress up as movie yep. characters like the Spring Breakers or like um, like uh, the dogs, for the, the two little um, actresses for The Shining come and play with us. You know, yep. they're dressed up. <laughs> they're full women, you know. Um, yeah. So they hang about because they're watching movies. They're learning for the internet. They're learning for the culture. The dolls are learning. But one of the, this main doll is the dominant doll. She's teaching the other the two dolls how to fight and shoot and stab. Yep. He's so cocked to his head because they're actually making the AI films. They're writing the films because you can write them because they're shit, you know. So he's <laughs> he, he's like um he's like Alfred Molina and Boogie Nights, you know. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's just good at the, the, the bangers. He's he doesn't know what day it is. He doesn't even, he doesn't even get out of bed because this is all running with the dogs. Yeah. Um, so they're doing their own shit. But we, the financer comes in and he's wanting to do a deal with the doll company to actually he brings at the end of the movie he brings all these club owners in that are on strip clubs and brothels across the world and they think if we can get all these dolls for this company. We can get rid of our workers. Yep. We don't need to pay them. We don't need whatever. It's like Hollywood strike at the moment. Right. Hollywood's no trade. Yeah, yeah. So my personal stuff comes in there, you know. Well, that's what I was going to say to you, David. You were saying, you were to extrapolate from what you were saying earlier and what you're saying now, you're not merely interested in exploitation or horror no. per se. And you said, you know, we've got this central character, this protagonist who almost feels left behind. What are you injecting from your own self? Is there quite a lot of you in that character? Is that what you're saying? I think if you don't reveal a bit of your own self, then you're not really what you're really yeah. doing. If you're not bringing your experience, even if it's a, a trashy sounding genre movie, if you're not really bringing your own experience, then you're just making you you're just making something that you think is going to get an audience. Or oh, there's women, there's there's horror, there's yeah. you know breasts and yeah. boobs. You're making a piece of shit, you know. So you got to try and make a personal movie in there. Um, but at the end of the movie turns out a bit like Carrie, we are a massacre bloodfest right. with all the guys. And, and, <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is deliver and try to break the rules a little bit. Well, you can't show this, you can't do that, you can't see this. Well, why can't you? You can do what I want these days. Well, you won't get it on. You won't get it on a, a cinema screen. Well, who the fuck gets on a cinema screen anyway? <laughs> you know, <laughs> get out a festival. So I've got a version that you can tone it down for the festivals yep. and for the mainstream streaming, and I'll have the version for the Blu-ray that is unedited. The director's I'll cut. I'll go. I'll go full Tonto on it. You know. <laughs> you know, and the director's cut the downloads. Um, so I want that version where I don't want to stick by the rules. I mean, put it this way: when you watch EastEnders, right? For th I don't watch EastEnders, but for forty years, and somebody in Albert Square's never said a swear word. That's very <laughs> odd. Isn't that it's really odd? Hey, it would be different if you lived your life pre-Watershed. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, but it, in, in terms of that's meant to be the world. I know. No, it's, it's yeah. not the world. It's very odd. So, and the parameters, even movies, it's like, well, you can't do that, you can't show it. Well, why not? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I don't mean... I'm, I've, I've not got any interest to do something sensational for the sake of sensational. Because, look, nudity, right? 
Oh, oh, there's nudity in it. Who cares? You can see anything these days. That doesn't sell oh. it. It's got to be a story that is interesting, but kind of sexy and horrific and bloody and colourful and exciting and something different. You know. But David, you you don't have to you don't have to apologise to us. We like sensational. We even <laughs> we even done video nasty month last October. So <laughs> so you've got the task because I'm strongly assuming here there is some seventies sexploitation influences going on in your head. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. What, Absolutely. what were yeah. some of those influences that? What influenced your avenue? What influenced psycho sex dolls? It's not so much influenced that. It's that it's some of the, the the fantasy sort of colourful sort of you you know your Mar Mario Bavas and your Joe yep. Sarno's Joe Sarno from the sixties made sex exploitation movies. I mean they're very dated, you yeah. know, at the time, you know. But you try and and and. Uh, Russ Mayer, you know, oh, yeah. his movies. Beyond the Valley very, of the Dolls, great film. He, he controlled them and they were very colourful and you say, oh, they're, they're dated at the time or they, they don't really transfer. But we're world is... We, we try to pretend that we're world is really PC today. Is it hell? You can go on there and, <laughs> and see anything and stuff that's really dark and horrible, yeah. you know. So what I'm trying to just do... And, 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 and to be honest about it, I'm not making a bloody feminist movie. I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to... Nobody's going to buy that. But the men actually don't come up pretty well in this. Mm. The men come across as because, it, even though the the, the 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 female characters are you know sexual characters and whatever, the main character her 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 goal is to get away from being a sort of a, a servant for these guys and get free outside the studio. Her goal is to go and live a life away from that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of it kind of I think it would be the, the sort of movie that guys would watch, right? But then. There's a bit of word of mouth that I think women would watch it as well because women like horror and the characters yep. in the story are pretty. The female characters are characters; they're no dogs, you know. Yeah. Especially the central character. Um, so it's. Um, I think you're just trying to. For me, it is doing personal movies, but you're just trying to wrap it in a movie for all the influences that you've had over the years for your Roger Commons, Martin Scorsese's. All these seventies exploit, even your Jess Frankels that yeah. he made a lot of crap, but you yeah. go he made, made some good stuff and John Rowland, John Rowland, yeah, 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 exactly. And the spirit of that, um, everything is so kind of corporate and real today, and very polished and very corporate, very PR and, ready, and very yeah. no risk taken. You know, yeah. it's like, well, if anybody can take risks, it's guys like me because yeah. I'm only getting money for Kickstarter, so. Most people can't be experimental because they're taking money for a studio or a company. Like an example, during this movie, when I started the first Kickstarter campaign, I got two offers. One was for 175000 one was for 150000 They are making this movie with 10, 15K, whatever, right? People go, oh, why do you take that money? Because I've had the experience of that in the first yeah. one. The nightmare yeah. of that is. And they'll pay me 10 grand up front. I'm involved in the movie for a year. That's less than McDonald's wage. They own it. <laughs> They own it. That's true. They yeah. control it. They tell me what to do. It's like that doesn't even. I'm better doing the the the, the ten fifteen grand version. The location's great. The acting will be the same. The movie will pretty much look the same. I own it. I can do what I want. I, own, I can do the sequel later if I want. You know. So that's the reason. You know. Yeah, do you think people that ha nowadays like cinema goers they have like a good eye for fakery that maybe the studios don't think about? Like you can look at a film that. The, a filmmaker makes and you can think right this filmmaker obviously had full control and they went all the way with what they were trying to do but there's another situation where maybe the filmmaker was bought out by the studio and they had to kind of compromise the vision do you oh, think yeah. Uh, yeah do you think people have a good eye for that kind of thing they can tell when someone's been done all the way or when someone's been kind of half-assed especially in like exploitation films i think people oh yeah i mean i think fans of films spot that right away they can see know. through it and companies always underestimate that they think they know the best and look Hollywood's also geniuses Hollywood is very smart because they throw millions at a film and they're great at marketing and they've actually hypnotised a lot of people that superhero movies are all the way to go and people will fight Martin Scorsese and come in and all oh, yeah. he's an old you know and they don't get it they don't get the point so the studios are really really smart but I think people are really fans of all sorts of movies you know, mm -hmm. um, for the movies that you guys love, know where there's bullshit. Um, uh, and and look, and when you're making a film, there's one thing that I agree with Quentin Tarantino that he talked about. He says, when you make a movie, you have to make the movie that you haven't seen yet. That you're looking right. for it, you haven't seen it, you haven't really. Every movie is the same as every other movie, right? You can't get a completely original movie, but you have to. Where's that movie that I would really like to see? It isn't there? 
well, go make that movie then. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think you have to do that, you know. Yeah, that's that's where the good ideas come from, where someone says, oh, why don't they make a movie where they do such and such? You think, well, that's your idea, you should make that, but because of, I don't know, like Hollywood cowardice, because it doesn't have a studio name attached to it, because it's not a... You talk about Tom Cruise not doing risky films. He's on, what, Mission Impossible 7 now or something? Yeah. I mean... Films like that, you can just keep slapping the Mission Impossible label and it's going to keep selling because it's recognisable. People talk about why is films all remakes and sequels and prequels? Like Because they have recognisable names. It's bankable. Those are, much e- those are much easier to sell than some independent film from an independent filmmaker no one's ever heard of. It's economics. When Hollywood's going to spend $100 million, right, then they have to... It's because there's a novel there. It's because there's a comic there. It's because there's a toy there. That's because then there's a ready-made audience. It's too risky. But it's greed that's set in because they want to make billions. Mm. You know, it's greed. You know, it started from, you know. So prior to this film, the one you're trying to make, Psycho Sex Dolls, you've been pretty much self-funding your films. Why have you gone the Kickstarter, the crowd crowdfunding route? Because I know there's been some success, some non-success in the last decade or so. I know Argento tried to fund The Sandman, which was to start Iggy Pop through Kickstarter. Jim Van Beber successfully crowdfunded Gator Green, which was a short film that he was crowdfunding, and then he filmed a short film, and it was going to act as a promo to get funding for a full feature. So why mm. have you pivoted from self-funded to the crowdfunding? I think because the films that I made over the years, I'd done one movie called Mission X, a military movie that I funded, I shot over a year, (laughs) um, that I funded myself from a job. um, And then the crime movies and then a movie in America went, it was a little bit of Kickstarter. Most of them have been self-funded and some people that have been coming to my website and gave some money, some some loyal people that have been there for years, but most of it have been self-funded. Um, the reason because when I self-funded I was making them for like a couple of thousand that I could fund for corporate video jobs and stuff um, this one even though it's had no budget it still was taking a bit of a more of a leap you know yep. um, and I've spent I've got a family so I've spent quite a lot of money over the years and they've sacrificed for that and I've got a wee boy right. so it, it's no fair to them anymore for me to be putting money that I earn into all the films they've got to you know get, get the stuff that they need to get so now I go I've, okay if I've got people that want to be involved with it yep. and I hate this thing I, I don't accept donations I want somebody to get something I want to get a poster I want to get a, a unique poster I want to get my producer credit I want them to get an experience you know so I thought okay so if I need a higher budget but I don't want to go on and get a budget where if I raise 3000 then I still can't make the movie. So Kickstarter is good for that because if you don't hit the target, you're not making it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, which the first one failed and the second one has gone good, good now. Um, so, you know, there's, there is, even though it's tiny budgets, there's still a leap from 2000 to 10000 to get, you know, to make a film. Especially in this movie. This movie could probably be made for cheaper if it was just regular actors and actresses, but because yep. I've got I've got a few adult actresses in this that do adult films, they don't come cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when women are taking their clothes off, they don't come cheap, which I completely understand. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. You know, yeah, they've got a, a rate card which I completely respect. So uh, that costs a little bit more. You know, the most you know. Starring in this film is Stella Paris, which is an actress I'm not familiar with. Though l- researching her, I did realise she was born in Malta, which is where I was christened, funnily enough. All right. My, my, <laughs> my father's from Malta. So can you tell us a bit about Stella Paris? How she came to the project? What was her previous work? How you came to cast her? There was a, there was a few filmmakers doing a little anthology series, a horror anthology series called Video Shop Terror Tales, I think. Yep online mm-hmm. um, and I knew one of the filmmakers Andrew Alias um, and I saw Stella in a little clip in one of the films I think she was just like a, a little brief role you right. know um, and some t- look there's thousands of women that are online that have got you know um, and do content and stuff like that so that doesn't mean anything do you know what I mean there has to be something else there has to be something else in somebody that's some doing substance. adult content there has to be something you know um, so I, I, I started following her stuff and then I seen that she was uh doing music, she had a vegan shop and everything else. But she was interested in movies. She does adult content, but she was interested in movies. And a lot of women that do adult content are not interested in movies at all, you know. So you're trying to find people that like movies, that like genre movies, because they bring another passion and an energy and enthusiasm. Um, and also, people think, well, can they act? Most of these women can act, because they're acting that... <laughs> 
<laughs> when, when they perform for guys, they can act. <laughs> you yeah, know. That, that, that basically is their acting, putting on those performances. Marlon Brando, there's a scene with Marlon Brando talking in an interview, and he says, what's acting? And he says, there's, there's a dog, the dog, he had a dog beside him, the dog was pretend. he says, the dog pretends he loves me, but he just wants a cookie, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> My cat's like that. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Over the years, I've used a lot of non-actors and I've actually got a lot of experience, with, a great experience with non-actors because non-actors break rules because actors have been to drama school, stick right. within the parameters of drama school. Non-actors don't. They just try shit. You know, and I've always had better experiences. Unless you can afford, you know, Hollywood and big, really experienced names. I try to be experimental with people. So she ticked a lot of boxes, and then when I spoke to her a couple of times, I let, I've got to like the person as a yep. person. So like John Cazavetti is always working with the same team people. Tim Burton always working with the same people. Matt Scorsese. It's a really important factor when you're casting. You've got to like people. You build a rapport as them. well. Because you're going to be in the trenches when you make a film. It's very yep. tough. So you've got to you've got to be with that person for whether well, it's a few days, a few weeks, whatever. So you've got to get on with them, you know. So I liked her as a person, you know. Yeah. Um, I spoke to her a few times on the phone. Got to meet her uh, next week. Um, so that was the reason I cast Stella, and she's the role that is the the other two dogs don't really need to be acting experience because they're dogs. They're not like this. No, no. But they're they're very silent. So it's very they're different very from that Only Fools and Horses episode. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, if I if I didn't if I didn't get any budget at all, I'd have three blow up dolls yeah. and do some of yeah. that. <laughs> that would be the Roger <laughs> Corman film. That's the Roger yeah. Corman one, yeah. you know. But the other two dolls are very silent, and uh, they kind of they almost do as they're told. So they don't need acting experience. It has to be more visual. Yeah. But still, has to be a performance between her and the filmmaker, which is as an actor that will be casted in that role, you know experienced actor you know so, so do you have a trajectory so, when you want would like to film this i know you're still in the process of crowdfunding so is there a idea is there a date set is there yeah i, I don't like to uh i don't like to say oh I'll work this certain and get my ducks in a row i like to move i like right. action i believe yeah. in getting things done so if people have gave me money um I, i've set a date so i went and found the studio last week i found the perfect place that was quite difficult to get met the guy and it's 95% it's going to yeah. be shot in the studio because it's got nooks and crannies and basements and everything Is else. Is this London, yeah. Scotland? or uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh. Edinburgh, oh, Scottish oh, production. That's yeah. Been nice. Yeah, so it's going to be shot in Edinburgh. So there's, there's actors coming up for London and across for maybe Europe as well. So it's shot um, on the 17th of November to the for a full week. Um, mm. And then uh, there's a couple of there's a, an apartment scene and a couple of shots in a car and stuff like that. So it's shooting. It'll be finished. It'll be edited in two months over December, yeah. January, yeah. and then I'll start to be submitted to festivals and probably take it to Cannes for the first time in years. You know. Yeah. So you see, when you're talking about all these shots, you know you're going to do this in an apartment. This is going to be in the car, etc. When you kind of plan your film out, do you try to visualize it? Because I know some directors, for example, use lots of storyboards. Some use none at all. Are you more kind of like instinctual, like we'll just see what we do on the day, or do you like to kind of visualize everything in your head? You've still got. You still got to have a structure, um, but you've still got to have room within that structure because over the years, when I've made films, like when I made a horror movie in America. We couldn't afford to. We, we shot in classic motel rooms, right? But we didn't. Yeah. We couldn't get the motel room beforehand, so we went and shot. So I had to do things on the fly, which is a lot of times is really fun, you know. So over the years, I've kind of shot. I've turned up at locations, and I didn't know if I was going to get that location, so I've had to learn. Ridley Scott always says he learned over the years when he goes into a room, he knows where to put a camera. That's the one thing that I've learned over the years making quite a lot of low budget films. If I walk in a room, I know where the camera's going to be within five seconds. I don't have to mm. think about it. Oh, let's think about what we're doing. I know exactly where it's going to go. Um, so that's just the experience. So, but at the same time, and the thing is, I remember Larry Cohen talking about this, where he never planned out shots and, and uh, Black Caesar and stuff, because he says, if you plan out shots too much, especially outside, you go there on the day, the weather changes, the schedule changes, right. and then people really planned and they go, what do we do now? You know, um, whereas if you keep it kind of loose on the fly, you keep, then you go, right, we'll do this, we'll do that, right, we'll do yep. this, we'll change it this way. So there's a structure, but there's a looseness there. Um, when, you, when you're writing the material, how much is your perception of what the budget is going to be? How much does that dictate the scenes you're writing, the locations of the script how much is dictated by what you think the budget will achieve 
Everything, everything is really you're, you're writing for what you know you can get or what you've got. Right. Like last week, it was quite scary because I set this budget in Kickstarter, and I've got enough experience to know that I, if I can do this either way. But I still didn't have the location that I wanted because he's a filmmaker and he's been living in the nineties, and they're making kind of adult movies. You could set it in a, an apartment in, in these serviced apartments, but it would look crap. It, look, it wouldn't look as if it'd right. been lived in. Yep. You know. So I need a film studio that, that looks as if it's been there for years. It's been running for years. Um, so that was stressing me quite a bit, uh, you know, up until last week or the week before. And I saw a place in Edinburgh online and I went and seen the guy the next day and I was pitching him the movie. And uh, I says what I can afford and his rate was good. And I booked it there and yeah. then. So I knew when I got that location, the movie's is going to go up a way up in production value it's i can shoot it all here and it's going to look like the look put it this way even if i had a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand or a million i'd probably still sit it there right you know d d is yeah. it more expensive as well because it's based like kind of like in the 90s so is it being shot to make it look like that or is it just no, just but, kind of no, make you the can, place up, yeah? no you can make the place up with um posters and stuff like that um i wanted a, a studio looks like it's been lived in and it's yeah, worked yeah. in and there's there's lights here and there's wires and there's cables that i can't bring in it's already there yep. you know so more to do with that you know so does um, limitations breed creativity is the saying yeah yeah when you're yeah. formulating this screenplay and you know what you the parameters that you have to work within is that dictating is that creative is that you know exciting is, is it exciting it is exciting um also we always used to talk about this where you're always also looking for mistakes and happy accidents and things that you never expected oh we don't have that oh do you know what the story could go this yeah. way instead yeah. of that it becomes more um you solve prob if you don't solve problems creatively that's a problem if you and if you don't like problems yeah. as a filmmaker that's going to be a problem for you i love problems so Kubrick, Kubrick used to talk about this. Kubrick used to always say that he loves problem solving. And I never really realised the attraction for filmmaking until the last few right. years because you're in the basement of a ship and there's a hole and there's water coming in and then there's another one coming in and then there's 90 holes filling up. You've plastered yep. that one. And then you go, come on, give me some more. Yeah. You know, If you don't actually get off <laughs> on that, you yeah. actually got to get off on that as a filmmaker. But a lot of filmmakers go, oh, the actor's not turned up. Oh, there's... There's a light blowing. What do we do now? You actually love to have uh, problem solving. So in a way, I get my kick out of that, um, um, which is a really important thing in filmmaking, you know, uh, is problem solving. So, yeah, creatively problem solving is, is one of the best things because your mind always goes to, I need money to solve that problem. You go, mm -hmm. it's like at the moment, right, oh, I'm sure it's some money, right? Foot in the kickstart, I need probably a little bit more money. The movie's getting made, right? Okay, if I don't get the actual maybe 15,000, I may have to lose one of the fucking dolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many's left? How many's left? There may only be two of them. Yeah, right? But the movie, can still, the movie can still work. Or oh, I have to haggle yeah. and get the other actress for a cheaper... But I kind of like that. Do you know what I mean? You know. Yeah. Well, see, when it comes to the script as well, are you someone who likes a very kind of like tightly ordered script or are you someone who's very happy to let the actors improvise? Do you just give them a bit of free reign and maybe hope they come up with something that you hadn't thought of possibly? I remember a filmmaker years ago saying that if you get the exact movie, apart from the Coen brothers, I think they get the exact movie that they wrote in the script and they want that. But if you get the exact movie that you were thinking about and you wrote, for me, I feel as if I failed a little bit because mm. I want contributions that I never expected. I want an actor mm. to come up with something. that, And that's the way, being an actor as well, you're going to... Some directors have got an ego and they go, well, that's not what's written in the script. You have to do what I said. Whereas you have to yeah. let your ego go. And if an actor comes up with some lines that you never wrote that are great, I'm, I want those. Because <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm still going to get credit. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah no, I'd like to think if I was making a film, I'd be the same. Like, if you came up with a line that's better, you know, it's not. it shouldn't hurt my ego that, oh, you came up with something that's better than wrote. That's going to be better for the film. So I feel like yeah. that behavior, kind of behavior should be encouraged. It makes the cast and the crew feel involved as well that if they're part of the process. But at the same time, they don't, if an actor doesn't come up with anything that wasn't in the script, then at least you've got the script. You need that, you know. Yeah. You need that. You kind of just turn up, and you can with some movies like in the screen. That kind of a lot of that movie was shot without a script because it was very loose and non-dialogue. Depends yeah. on the movie, but if there's a heavy story-driven movie, but yeah, I have a lot of freedom um, for actors, and, and uh, you know, not so much crews because I'm not working with bigger crews like in my first movie. I'm working with a lot of kind of people that are no highly experienced that, but they're reliable. Yeah. So I'm kind of dictating the shots because they're not really camera people, you know, but they're assisting, you know. 
where, where did you learn your screenwriting craft? Did you go through your whole Sid Field phase or is it just completely <laughs> self-taught? Um, I never went any courses. I never learned nothing. I started reading uh, almost like a lot of novel writers say, read novels. Just I keep le- reading. I read a lot yeah. of screenplays, watched a lot of movies. And you subconsciously start to kind of, you know, get an idea about certain acts and this structure. And then you learn the rhythm of the piece. You learn the rhythm of a piece subconsciously. So, but you learn it by, I mean, I used to write a lot of scripts and then throw them in the bin. (laughs) That is utter shit. (laughs) Um, But it's better, it's better you throw the script in the bin and make the movie. That's really, really worse. (laughs) You know, um, know, some movies that I would rather just put in the bin, you know, Um, but yeah, I mean, think I'd just be doing it. I think really, I mean, I've learned everything through um, almost cameras and everything else by doing and doing and failing and doing and failing. Like tr- tr- trial and error, basically. Exactly. Um, micro, um, as long as you're not mortgaging, mortgaging your house to do something, to feel with something. Casavetes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 Casavetes. But that was back in a different time where it would cost a fortune to even make an independent movie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, Casavetes would be shooting today cheaper than Austin Wells, you know. Yeah. But oh, yeah, I think just be, and that's, I think yeah, a lot of people take themselves very seriously, so they're not willing to fail, and they don't want to fail in public, and they don't want to go and kickstart and see that nobody's gave you any money. That's too scary. I don't care at this age. I don't give a shit. Can you watch a film? Can you watch a film and see where somebody is consciously playing it safe? They know they've been told by the producer, look, tone this down, change this. Can you consciously now see those things within a piece? Oh yeah, all the Can time you? you see things. <laughs> I, but you understand it why. I can understand why for the other side, um, you know, somebody was giving me a budget, I'd, I'd know the places that they would want me to yeah. no go and yeah. uh, things that I need to do. But if you agree to do that, you have to work it. I'm getting a big fat paycheck here. <laughs> <laughs> and I can take that paycheck back to my other things. So yeah, I can. Yeah, you can definitely see it because it's a structure, it's a formula. It still is a formula, do you know what I mean? To, uh, to, to take it back to psycho sex dolls, uh, I want to ask, you said before about AI, and I know that's the big thing everyone's talking about with the Hollywood strike and stuff like that. Uh, when I watched your Kickstarter video, you were talking about the kind of messaging in the film and how you wanted it to be kind of kind of subtle, kind of underground, like you say, you know, wrapping it in sugar, you said before. Mm-hmm. How do you feel like the difference between uh, a message in a film that's very subtle and one that's just kind of rubbed in your face? How would you kind of define the differences between the two? I think if you're going to do, if you really do want to do a strong message movie, I think you should make a documentary. You know, I love, yeah, yeah. I love documentaries. I'm a big fan of documentaries yes. because I've got a message too, yeah. in them. I probably watch more documentaries these days than I watch, fix, you know, films. So if you're going to make a movie, I think you can still put a message in it. I mean, you know, a lot of the great filmmakers that I love. Again, we're talking about Casavetes. His message is about love and everything else. Well, people, um, people. He's a humanist, isn't people. he? People. Yeah. yeah, he's about people. You know, but I think. Uh, People don't want to be hit over the head no. in a message. Either. It's when it's really bad and kind of patronising. Although yeah. some, th- I mean, that's why everybody loves Ricky Gervais. But you know, I watch some of the stuff. You go, that's really patronising. It's like I get that. I get that. I get that. Are you on about Derek? I really love that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, quite a few things, but but then sometimes you realise well you're not patronising everybody because people don't get it. <laughs> it's maybe yeah, patronising yeah. you. Um, but for me, I don't want to make something that I, I need to get a message. Like here's a writer strike that happened in LA when I was thinking coming a guy with cycle sex dolls. I wasn't even thinking about any of that. But when I was writing that, that just came in with the AI element because the AI element is there. An example, in fact, here's a story when I when I was telling you about the title for yeah. cycle sex dolls. I went okay, right, okay, what's the poster for us? It's an I think about AI AI dolls. Where where is AI? I was like that. Where is AI? So I went in and then I discovered how to make some AI art. And I went, can I do an AI doll? And I went like that. I'm doing, and this this there was a lot of dolls that were really weird looking and funny shapes. <laughs> <laughs> Big one ear. Hey, everybody has their and own tastes. Yeah, <laughs> but then I pressed this button. And then this doll came up with a screaming face, which is one of the pictures that I've put out there. And I went, and I put the, the title across it, and I put the tagline, and I went, there's a fucking wow. movie. You know, it just came out. It just came alive, and I went, that's that. I need to do this. Now, that can happen with a post. Yeah. Now, that was done by AI, and everybody's telling about the terrible things with AI. But I think you've got to, everybody talked about the terrible things with social media and VHS disappearing, DVD disappearing. Yep. You've got to evolve. So... Can I use AI yeah. to help me in this as well? Because am I doing an artist out of work? No, because I would not be able to afford that poster any. It costs more than the bloody movie. <laughs> so I ended up doing all these posters yeah. and then I realised as well 
that I could actually do a one-to-one single edition of all these dolls, hundreds of them. So if somebody buys a single edition, the movie goes out, they've got a single edition of that AI sex dolls thing. So I've got a movie that's criticising AI, but I'm actually using AI as well. Yeah. You know, within the marketing campaign, yeah. that'll be a big thing out there as well, which is so important. You can't just make your movie. You've got to think about how you're going to get it out there. You know? a, a moment ago, you mentioned the, the strikes in LA, the actor strikes. How does that affect you? What what kind of way do you deal with that? Because I know famously from Dust Till Dawn by Robert Rodriguez, he got into mm-hmm. a lot of stick for not using union cast, cast and crew. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, sorry, documents so, behind the scenes. So, so, Boogie, yeah. so how does that affect you as an independent filmmaker? Because obviously you may not have the finances to pay them a SAG wage, for example. So is there any leeway? Can you understand both sides of the story as an independent filmmaker? Or are you completely like, look, I under- completely understand why these actors are striking? Oh, no, I understand why. Look, a lot of these people work in Hollywood. It is an industry job yeah. for them. They're working in TV shows. That is their job. Yeah. It's like going to a, a big job. It's not that we end independent movies. And also some actors are doing voiceovers, right? And they're doing voiceovers and they're getting paid a few thousand for the one day, but they're keeping their voice for the rest right. of their life and using it in multiple movies. That's really bad. Oh, that's bad, yeah. I mean, that... That's really bad. Yeah. So that's what they're fighting for. They're also fighting, they used to get residuals in television, right, right. if they do a show. Right, when streaming kicked in on Netflix and Amazon, the residuals stopped because there's no record about how many people have seen it. So that's what they're fighting for as yep. well. All that stopped. So there's many areas that are complete. They're taking the piss, you know. <laughs> so in that industry, yeah, in terms of me very macro, no budget films, it doesn't affect in that way. And actually, I'm still paying people, and I'm paying people the actual union yep. rate. So when I employed yeah. actors, there's a minimum micro yep. budget rate, which is very low, but at least actors get paid. They're getting paid for the job. So I'm paying them that rate. So even if it was the same strike here, I'd, as, I think um, the comp, because it was, um, what's that company that done um, with the Adam Sandler movie, A so and so? Happy Madison. Um, no, the, um, A24. A24. Um, they were still continuing to uh, work because they were paying the actors yeah. what they should be paying them. Mm. You know, and Hollywood can pay them. They're just greedy buggers, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, no, so that doesn't affect uh, because but I'm still paying the actors. I, you know, for years I've done films where I've been working mainly with friends. Yep. You know, they go, we just want to make this film. Let's go make it, David. Don't care about it. And I've always fed them. And actually, I've always paid actors something, you know, because some people think, oh, you know, um, but a lot of actors I've worked with get businesses. So the day yeah. job, and we shoot at the weekends. So they, they actually, the day job funds their, you know. But um, on this movie, people are, are being paid. It's not much, but they're being paid. So no, that doesn't affect. When you were you filming know. Pasty Faces in LA and Las Vegas, did the SAG come into that or? Yeah, it did. Um, everybody was paid. Yeah. Um, some were paid bloody more than me. I get sniffed <laughs> on the movie. <laughs> I get I get an actor's wage because I acted in it, and all the actors get the wage. I get the same wage. I get stiffed on the director's uh, wage and the writer's yeah. wage. Um, yeah, I've heard that. I'm no bitch about that, right? <laughs> I'm not getting... But um, yeah, there was some. We had an assistant AD, an assistant director, who came from New York to Los Angeles to film with us. And every way we went, we were shooting in Hollywood Boulevard. It would duck, and I went. What are you doing, man? I, do you know I can't even remember his name? What, what the fuck? He, he worked in Sex and the City and stuff. Oh, like that. Yeah. And he was he was ducking everywhere. He's like one of the one of my uh, crew, one of the members. Just uh, he's just over there, mate. See me? And I went. What are you talking about? He says, "Well, I'm working in a kind of non-union movie. If he sees me working in a non-union movie, he shot me." Does that happen <laughs> a lot? Does that happen a lot? Or Jesus Christ! Is that po- um, is that is that does that happen a lot within I've, the industry? Uh, I think so. You know, well, it's such the union is such a stronghold and whatever, but. You know, there was other people working yeah. on the film that were doing. It was non-union, but they were paid. They were still paid a good wage. Oh, yeah. um, but they basically says, I've, "I'm choosing to work in this movie. I don't want to be dictated to that. I can't mm-hmm. work in this movie. I want to work in this movie. So I'm working this movie." But he hated. He ended up. He had to leave. He was so stressed. Oh, that he really? had to leave LA before he mm. went to Vegas and went to get another guy who didn't give a shit. He worked <laughs> in the movie. Um, in fact, no, that's not true. He left Las Vegas because I think somebody spotted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I, I experienced a little bit of that, um, but it worked in the, the other way as well. When we were in Las Vegas, I think you call them the Teamsters, you know. Yeah. yeah. When we worked in La- when we were shooting in Las Vegas, we were shooting. There was a Kevin Spacey shooting movie shooting uh, called Pay It Forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. And that. then there was a Kevin Costner movie shooting. Uh, was it five? Is it five thousand miles to Graceland or something? Yeah, that's right. Elvis. With Elvis, yeah. That was like the budget version they had of your movie, right? <laughs> And they get kicked to a casino because 
they broke some rules and they had 200 of your crew. The, the actual film office helped us everywhere. We shot in the Stardust, we shot in the Stratosphere Tower because mm. we were 50 a crew, we were small, we were mobile, we're the underdogs, you yeah. know, and that the unions actually helped us because with it, but we were still paying a basic you know rate you know so, is, is it really yeah. is it really is it really difficult to keep up with all these rules because it seems like there's like one rule for one group of people and then they suddenly change it to add a little caveat a little asterisk kind of thing so for doing films like this is it hard to keep in keep up with all the rules like how many kind of regulations do you have to have in your head at any one time to make sure you're not breaking any rules i think in, in, at this level that i'm working at it's just the basic safety rules and stuff and um, mm. li- li- liability insurances when people are in buildings or if you're shooting with guns that shot yeah. i shot a gun battle in glasgow ak 47s a few years ago <laughs> long before the Alec baldwin thing um, yeah, I, had yeah. to stick, I had to make sure everyone was safe there safety stuff mainly yeah. um when it's in micro budget things and uh, obviously actors contracts because it can come back to bite you in the, the bum years later when you know, uh, you have to have that really locked because when you're giving your film to uh, Amazon Prime and Apple TV, you have to have all those contracts together, you know. So you can't just say, oh, we're making a movie and we're friends and all that. It has to be really just as tight as it, if it was a bigger movie. You Is know? it hard to keep your inspiration and excitement for a project when you're dealing with all this behind the scenes, the navigating, the, the contract disputes, for example? Is it hard to keep that passion alive or is, is it just something you have to accept? No, I think for years... Um, I used to say, well, you're doing this and you're doing that, you're being entrepreneurial, it takes something away from the creativity. Yeah. I'll tell you, it takes everything away from the creativity. When you come up with an idea for a movie and you've wrote a script and you leave it in your draw for eight years and you've not made it, right. there's no creativity happening. There's no fire, there's no happening. At least if you're moving and you're making something, even if you have to do 100 jobs, your your creativity is firing. I always learned that from Robert Rodriguez where I saw him saying something about... Um, you get inspired. You don't get inspired by waiting. You get be inspired waiting for inspiration. You get inspired by action, right. and it, that is totally true. See, the minute you move, it's almost like that stone soup. You know that stone soup story. You know, have you heard that one with the stone soup? I don't think there's so. a guy I'm comes not. into it. There's a guy comes into a village, right, and he's got a stone, and he says, "I'm going to make some stone soup for the village." And he puts the stone in the boiling water, and he says, "Is somebody got an onion?" You know, oh, I've got an onion. <laughs> And then he goes, there's somebody got a carrot? I've got a carrot. And before you know it, he's got all these ingredients for a whole village mm. and he makes the soup. When you're making a film, it's a bit like that. When you, you start action, people want to be involved. People want to, things, you start to get offered deals. Right. You start to go off. Whereas if you just sit and wait, I have to wait to get my inspiration. I have to wait till the script's right. That That is a creative killer. That yeah. kills you creatively. So even if you have to do 100 jobs and it's all this other stuff, at least you're driving forward. I've, I'm writing a filmmaking book and a film day, and it's called Action. I don't mean action with a clapperboard. I mean action because that's what I've learned is the movement we action with things. Picasso always talked about that. A- action is really important. It's like action, you know, action propels motion in a sense. Yeah, um, and it, it, it can inspire yourself because it, there's a million reasons not to make a film. You know, mm. you've got, to, you know, there's a million reasons to turn you off. You know, <laughs> yeah. you've got to find those reasons. Um, you've always got, it's always, you've got to jump off the cliff and get the parachute going on when you're going down, you know. I do have to say your your story, you're 57 years old, as you say. And yeah. as you've acknowledged yourself, you're in the periphery of the industry. You've been trying, you've been ducking and t- diving, trying to get these things in motion. Yet you've na- never gave up. Was there ever a time, was there ever a place when you thought, Fuck this! I'm going to get a day job, a nine to five. I can't be doing with this. I've got a day job, which is making corporate videos and videos and gyms yeah. and stuff like that. So that's mm. the sort of day. I, I mean, a regular day. Oh yeah. I mean, as many times ago, if I could go back the way I, the amount, of, the amount that I work that I put into it, I could probably be a very successful businessman <laughs> in another area. Right? Do you know what I mean with money? But I've known so many people that are really rich. I mean, really rich people, and they're very unhappy because they were just the pursuit of money. So I think if I'd been pursuing trying to get in the industry for right. years, but after my first movie, I haven't been pursuing trying to get in the industry movie for movie for years. I've just been learning the craft and doing my own thing. It's only in the last 18 months that I went, right, I'm ready to deal with these fuckers to try and get a budget as well. <laughs> Kicking back against the pricks. <laughs> Because I've got no desperation, yep. right? So if I go to the Cannes Film Festival, whatever, and say, "This little movie, I've got this twenty-five million movie or this ten million movie," if you're desperate, I need this deal. If you're no desperate, 
if you're desperate, it's the worst place to come for to try to do a deal, you know. Um, it doesn't matter if I don't get it, whatever. I'm going to make my psycho sex dolls fucking free, whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's a good place to be. You but know? in the back of your head, does the dream still live? Do you always think you're one film away from making it, from being that huge film? Or or have you kind of resided to the fact that, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and then the other stuff's just mark it? I honestly, I honestly don't have those aspirations that some big dream because if you reach, I had a little taste of that in the first movie. Yep. Everybody's saying you're going to be this. I had 40 foot billboard posters across Scotland. I was on the Big Brother television. I had a little taste of that. And I realized that to, to constantly, people are constantly up and down, right? You constantly, there's no such plateau that you reach. But what I realized over the years was that there's so many people that are miserable that, put it this way, if I can get to a point, most I think most a lot of people hate their jobs. Say you're on 50k yep. a year, but you don't really like your job, right? And there's a lot of people like that, right? If you're earning a humble living and you're on 50k a year or less or more than that, but you love what you do, mm. you know, then you're, you're already way ahead of a lot of people. And then if you can build from that, so it's not about the big dream or the big, big deal. It's almost, can I get to a point where I'm doing it? And I'm making a film every six months even. I'm constantly doing it. And I'm earning a wage. And I'm building a brand. And I'm building a little audience. And I do it until I die. Um, I could be... Clint Eastwood still make movies. Ridley really Scott still make... I maybe have 20 years make movies in me. That's really the dream. Is to do it as a, a sort of... And if anything else becomes bigger, then it's just a bonus. You know? Um, because I know there'd be pressure with that. Because the bigger deals... You know, you've got a big movie. You can... Uh, if the movie doesn't work, then you're in direct, director's jail in Hollywood. Do you know what I mean? For You know? So... Uh, but if you do your own thing, you're not in any jail. You just keep moving. You know? Um, so you said earlier about, about like 99% of filmmakers kind of dropping out, you know, trying it for a bit and then finishing. I'm sure some people listen to this. There are people who maybe have their own ideas to make films. They want to be in the movie business. If you could give like one solid piece of advice to aspiring filmmakers all over, maybe the kind of advice you would like to have given yourself when you started the business, what would your one best piece of advice be to those people? I always hate... Uh, I don't feel I'm qualified to give advice, but the one thing, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. You know, it's like uh, you could be big successful, but even at that, you could be collapsing next week. But the one thing that there's one thing I can take it down to that, that I think is really important, and that's back to the first movie. Um, especially what you can do today, it's like mm. right, you want to be a filmmaker, then get a phone, right, a mm. right, and get a phone and get your friends and Sam Raimi used to talk about this and I know why now and get your friends and, and don't <clears throat> make it with any big pressure and don't even worry about Kickstarter get 200 quid in your pocket go and shoot a phone every weekend go and shoot another one go and shoot another one fuck everything up <laughs> make it really bad screw it up then one you find out or do you know what I mean? It's a mind fuck. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you then you back it and go and live a normal life, right? But if you continue through that, you'll not have wasted a lot of money, and then you start to get a passion, you start to get an energy, but you'll not have spent much money, and you start to fall in love with the process. It's fall in love with the process of filmmaking, storytelling. Um, start with nothing. Don't start the way I started, because mm -hmm. the best directors in the world start with nothing as well. Right. The big directors, because then they do they they retain control. Um, and even if you want to make a big say, oh, I want to make a big. Batman movie or a big sci-fi movie right Christopher Nolan never made a concept to show Batman he made following you mm. know um, John uh, John Favreau never made a concept to show Iron Man he made swingers you mm. know um, a lot of these directors never made big action movies to show that they wanted to make action right. they just made character stories and went out there and did it with what they had so the, the main lesson I think today is stop talking about it stop waiting to get your kicks that budget different with me I've got to take things to another level and need to go on um, but just go and make films with a DSLR with a phone and make dozens of them shorts whatever mm. to show you how you know if you really have the passion for it you'll continue on if you don't then you'll go fuck this I'm going to do something sensible <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> That's absolutely inspirational, David. You've been in the game for over two decades. You're still here. You're still doing it. You have self-funded. You have dealt with companies. And now you are doing the Kickstarter route, the crowdfunding route. Now, if our audience, to summarise this episode, if our audience is the production, some producers out there, they're listening. What is your sales pitch? Because you're here for Psycho Sex Dolls. What is your sales pitch to them? Well, first of all, the producers can fuck off. <laughs> 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 don't need the producers don't want them unless they've got 100 million to throw about yeah. you know they can go away don't need, I'm the producer right yeah. <laughs> don't need them they just want that. They, they just want to hang about with the chicks yeah. if they come and board my psycho sex doll right they want them you dolls know. they want them dolls don't they? Aye, they want them <laughs> dolls so I don't need those I don't need them right for me look outside pitching the movie right what I'm trying to do as well 
is like I'm trying to build my audience for years now. Whether it's fifty people, seventy people, five hundred, a thousand over years, you build it. And the only way you're going to build your audience is, is if you deliver and what you say you're going to deliver, yeah. and you make it a fun experience for them as well. If you say they can be in the movie, they're in the movie. If you say they've got a fun little unique poster that nobody else has got, they're going to get that. If you say they've got this, they're going to. If they say, if you say you're going to do this and shooting this day, and you're going to try your best, at least you're not going to give up. Then you're going to do it. You deliver. I think. Because people follow people and people follow stories, so your story has got to be a movie as well. I think. Um, so for me, it, this is a conscious decision when getting into Kickstarter is to say, right, I want to try and build this little audience along the journey with me and take them everywhere that I go. You know, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to update the Kickstarter dates. Because years ago I done a little Kickstarter and we were all guilty of that. I just want to make a movie. I don't want to promote it. I don't want to. Uh, fuck, I'll get posted the There you go. Mm. No, it's really important for me. For people that, that get on board with me, collaborators and funders, it's really important for me that they be part of the sort of process. To a certain extent, no sending me ideas and saying, can you cast this person and cast that person? Because I've had some of that. You want them at arm's you length. Know. Yeah, yeah, because that defeats the point of being an independent yeah. doing it yourself. Do you know what I mean? But you want them to be involved with the fun process and then say, right, if I do a sequel, I'm doing a sequel in the States, then you, okay, we'll do a scene in Vegas and there'll be a big hotel scene and you can come along and you can be... There'll be a sex doll convention. I'll be a sex doll con- <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of control and I'll be back on here in five years' time that I've sold yeah. it and it's went in my head yeah. and I'm like, I'm like you have now. You da- know? <laughs> David's gone sex doll mad. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is um, for people to be part of something, it's more to do, I think, they're following your journey as well. So I- I'm interested in people... Um, that's important to me. It's not just making the movie. I could go and make a movie tomorrow with more money. You know, I've consciously done this in Kickstarter to try and start a little uh, following there and deliver on it and kind of share my own story through it. Do you know what I mean? Um, along the way, that's the main thing. It's not just pitching a movie. You know, nobody really knows if something's going to turn out to be a pile of shit. You know, <laughs> when they're given <laughs> money. True. I mean, let's face it, they're trusting you. So I think when people, I mean, this is back to the industry, right? When people gave me money, when I did my first pitch down in London in Soho, I pitched to one of the main guys, the sales agent, and he, I pitched them the movie, right? And he says, you haven't touched your coffee in five minutes. He says, I'm interested, because he says, your energy. Uh. So they didn't even know if the script was good. I'd showed them posters, I'd showed them photographs, I'd done a little teaser trailer. They bought it to me. They didn't really buy it in the movie, you know. So I think that's important as well, you know. So thank you very much. That was David Wilde, writer, producer, director of Psycho Sex Dolls. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, sir. This has been episode 65 of In Film We Trust. I'm Wayne. I'm Liam. Join us next week where we'll discuss, dissect and deep dive all things film from the obscure to the mainstream. <laughs> <laughs>